First time to the third and closing session of the Cheminformatics and Artificial Intelligence Colloquium organized by the School of Chemistry at UNAM. Today, we also have a great panel of speakers that, as the speakers of the first two sessions, are shaping the field of cheminformatics and artificial intelligence. Now it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our first speaker of today, Professor Gerald Majora. Professor Majora received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and a PhD in Biophysics from the University of California, Davis. He was postdoctoral fellow at the University of Kansas. In 1970, he joined the University of Kansas as an assistant and then full professor of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. From 1985 to 2003, he worked in the pharmaceutical industry as director of computer-aided drug discovery at Option Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then a senior research fellow in Pharmacia Corporation. Later, he moved to Arizona, where he was professor of pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Arizona, and also held possessions at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix. Currently, Professor Majora is adjunct research professor at the Bio5 Institute of the University of Arizona. While in the pharmaceutical industry, his research focused on computational aspects of drug design and chemical informatics, with emphasis on applications of chemical space, activity landscapes, and activity cliffs. Currently, he's continued his work on chemical spaces and soft computing approaches to SAR analysis applied to the identification and design of new bioactive molecules and drugs. In recognition of his work in chemical informatics, he received the 2008 Hermal Skolnik Award in Chemical Informatics presented by the Division of Chemical Information of the American Chemical Society. And in 2020, the Fujita Award by the QSAR Cheminformatics and Modeling Society, among other prizes. Thank you so much. Very for joining us. And now I'm going to sh um, share your slides so you can begin your, your lecture. Thank okay, you so much. Can you, can you put that on full screen? Oh, there you go. Thank you, Jose. Uh, yes, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to be able to tell you something about what I call softening the rule of five, where to draw the line. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge uh, those who contributed to this work, Natalie Maurice, 
Jacques, Joaquin Petit and Christine Kaiser, they were at the time this work was, the first part of this work was done, they were at Translational Genomics in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, now, as you can see on the screen, Natalie is working for Abvi. Joachim is working for Mayo Research and Christine Kaiser is at Merck. So these are the people that worked with me on the soft rule of five. I also want to acknowledge Tim Ross. I, I did a sabbatical at the University of New Mexico uh, on fuzzy mathematics, which is really the basis of what I'm going to be talking about today. And also a colleague for many years, Paul Mezzi, who is retired now, but was at the University of Newfoundland. So, uh, and some of the work that I'll be talking today appeared in a paper called Softening the Rule of Five, Where to Draw the Line, uh, back in 2012. Oh, next slide, please. Next slide, oh, there you go. Okay, so what is this talk about? Uh, it's about a number of things, but obviously the Rule of Five, but it's about soft computing and fuzzy mathematics and I'm going to provide a very brief introduction to fuzzy sets and contrast them to classical and what are called crisp sets. Uh, and then I will talk about how these are applied to softening the rule of five. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what is soft computing? So Lofty Zada was, is basically the father of fuzzy mathematics. And he says soft computing is an emerging approach to computing which parallels the remarkable ability of the human mind to reason and to learn in an environment of uncertainty and precision. And this, of course, is the environment of doing much research, certainly biological research. And I just wanted to indicate uh, some aspects of uh, soft computing. Fuzzy mathematics is obviously an integral part. Neural networks, uh, genetic and evolutionary algorithms, belief belief networks, rough set theory, and so forth. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, why, why choose fuzzy mathematics? So as, as Lofty Zada says, as the amount of information grows, and I think this is an important issue, the level of detail at which it can be treated effectively must decrease. And I think you'll see as I go on how fuzzy mathematics can ad address this issue. Many real problems are inherently fuzzy or can be formulated in terms of these kinds of mathematical concepts, which tend to yield more robust solutions. And importantly, fuzzy mathematics, as you will see, provides a structure for dealing with impre imprecision and vagueness. These are issues that occur in research all the time. And the classical sets really can't deal with this. Fuzzy mathematics provides a basis for approximate re reasoning and importantly, fuzzy sets generalize classical crisp sets. So I think you'll see this as I go along. So next slide, please. All right, so what are sources of uncertainty and imprecision? So uh, they're, they're measurements. So there's errors in measurement, the resolution of a measurement and the fact that some measurements are incomplete. Uh, there's the idea of randomness, which uh, as an example would be a coin toss or radioactive decay. And, and the important one that's really neglected mu uh, very much is, is what I would call linguistic imprecision or vagueness. And the examples of that are things like very soluble compound, moderately active, large molecular weight. How do you deal with terms like large, what does that mean? And how can you deal with it mathematically? Well, this is something that fuzzy sets can deal with quite easily. Oh, next slide, please. So uncertainty and imprecision, I like this quote, and you'll see I have several quotes from Albert Einstein, who's obviously a pretty good scientist and has a lot of good insights. And he says, so far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And so far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. And I think my favorite quote of, quote of all is from, a, is from a painter, Henri Matisse, uh, and his statement is, precision is not truth. And I think we'll keep that in mind as we go along. The next slide, please. Okay, so here are just some brief examples of applications of fuzzy mathematics. 
uh, and these applications you can see are done in mo more traditional mathematics, clustering, classification, pattern recognition, decision theory, and so forth, and expert systems. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that are done typically in a lot of machine learning, and also this can be fuzzified as well. So next slide, please. Okay, what are fuzzy sets? So on the left, you see a subset of peaches, and on the right, a subset of plums. Next slide, please. There we go. So, so the question now arises, which subset does the nectarine belong to? Uh, and, and since it's a little bit of both, and the answer is on the next slide, about 60% of a nectarine is a peach and about 40% uh, and about is uh, a plum. So this is getting to the notion of a fuzzy set. So in a fuzzy set, as opposed to a classic set where something is or is not in the set, in a fuzzy set, an object is there to some degree, okay? And I will elaborate that on the next slide. Okay, so here's the, here's the uh, representing fuzzy set. Here's a, crisp, a classical crisp set. And first we speak of the universe of discourse as you can see at the top of the slide. And these are just the objects you're dealing with, okay? So in crisp sets, uh, there's several ways to treat these, but one of the ways, and this is a way that allows generalization to fuzzy sets, is the notion of a characteristic function. So this function has a value of zero or one, nothing in between. So if it's zero, the object is not in the set. If it's one, the object is. And you see two examples to the right, a continuous example uh, where between certain values, uh, whatever these values or objects are, they're in the set. And typically we're dealing with discrete sets, which is to the right of that diagram. And you can see that objects one, two, four, five, and seven are in the set, and objects uh, three and six are not in the set. Next slide, please. So this is, this is how fuzzy sets differ then. So rather than a characteristic function, fuzzy sets have what are called membership functions. And as you can see below that, the value for a membership function uh, lie between, or it's on the unit interval of the real line, so it lies it includes zero and one and lies in all points in between there. And this is interpreted as the degree to which the object belongs to the set. Okay, and then you can see, for example, uh, an, uh, examples of continuous fuzzy sets, which you'll see in what I'm gonna present a little bit later, and also discrete fuzzy sets. But you can see that the, the height of these bars represents a degree to which that object is in the set and they're gonna lie between zero and one. So you can give it in percentages you like, but in mathematical terms, it's between zero and one. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how do we represent these? Everybody I'm sure in this audience knows about bit vectors and that's the traditional way you represent objects that are in a classical crisp set. So one that belongs to the set, zero, it does not. Fuzzy sets uh, are, uh, are described by what are called fit vectors. This was coined by Bart Tosco a number of years ago. He's written a number of articles and books on fuzzy mathematics, but he coined this a fit vector. And you can see the values there uh, are fractional values. So uh, the first like object X1, for example, is three tenths, uh, belongs to the set, whatever the set is, A, uh, to degree three, point three, and so forth. Uh, and so as I show below, characteristic function says an object is or is not in the set, and a membership function says a degree to which an object is in the set. And this is, this is an important generalization. And you can see be, that fuzzy sets obviously are a more general concept than a crisp set. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this sometimes is an issue, and so I thought I would put a slide in here to talk about this. So the idea is what's the difference between set membership and probability, because both of their values lie on the unit interval. Uh, so for example, what we have are two flasks full of 
liquid. On the flask on the left is a liquid that has poison in it. And the flask on the right has water. Okay, so the question arises and you see these two beakers, the one on the left says, the probability that the poison water, that it has poisoned water is 0.1. And the one and the beaker on the right says that the membership function, the degree to which this liquid in this beaker belongs to uh, the set of poison, uh, poisoned water is 0.1. So which one would you drink out? Well, if I were doing it and I had to drink one of the two, I would drink the one on the left that says it's a probability of 0.1. So it means that 90% chance that it really isn't poison water. Uh, and whereas the, the beaker on the right that has a membership of 0.1, it really says that this water actually is poisoned to 10%, you know, to a degree of 10%. So it'd be obviously better to take your chances with the beaker on the left. Next slide, please. But this is the difference between probability and this membership function. They're not the same concepts. All right, these are operations on fuzzy sets. And these are the traditional ones that you do on crisp sets, except they're a little bit more general. But if you see the functions that lie below the figures, A union B, and then is the max of, of the, for, for a given element of a set A and then fuzzy set B. And notice in the fuzzy sets, there's a little squiggle underneath the letters just to indicate that we're talking about fuzzy sets and not crisp, crisp sets. But you can see that the union of the sets, just look at the picture and you can see how that is. I, unfortunately, I can't uh, use my pointer to do this. And the intersection set is just the minimum of these two functions, which are the membership functions. They're outlined in blue. And then the what's outlined in dark or what's in dark is, is whatever the issue is. You can see the intersection set, you can see the complement set, and you can see subset hood. And in subset hood, as is clear from this picture, all the elements uh, that belong to set fuzzy set B have membership values that are less than the values of those of, of fuzzy set A, okay? So next slide, please. All right, so uh, I, I need to introduce one additional concept and this is the notion of aggregating a fuzzy set. So there's several, well, there's more ways than I'm describing here, but I'll just describe the ways that are relevant to what I'm gonna speak about later. Uh, so one is the measure of a set, and that's just the cardinality. If this were a classical set, that would just mean you count the number of objects in the set. But the objects in fuzzy sets don't, are not either zero or one. They either are or are not. They're into some degree. So basically, the cardinality of a fuzzy set is you just sum up the membership functions. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So the arithmetic mean is, is another aggregating function and we're not gonna, we'll use something related to that. So you see that at AGG with a sub AM, that's arithmetic mean. And you can see to the right of that, just what, what we all know is the, is the mean function. And the mean and the value of that is gonna lie between the maximum value of an element in A and the minimum value. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're getting to the weighted mean, which is what I'm gonna use when I talk about uh, the soft rule of five. Okay, so here, uh, this is just, it looks similar to the mean, except there's a weighting factor in here and it's true of all weighting factors. They're, they're known, they have positive values, so they're either zero or positive, and, they sum, and the sum of all the weighting factors should equal one. And I just make an example here. For example, you could take activities and you could generate weights with activities. We're not going to do that here, but, but um, I, I will show you how we get the weighting factors. This is a particular way of doing this. Okay. And I've cited a couple references at the bottom here to these issues. Next slide, please. All right, so here is the actual crux of the whole thing. And this is the reason we're, we're gonna go from a crisp view of the world to a fuzzy view. 
Okay, so now we have, just as an example, we have uh, along the horizontal axis, the x-axis, we have solubility and we have two sets. A set, um, we could have more, but we have two sets here, a set of moderately soluble molecules and a set of soluble molecules. And you can see uh, by the xi and xj that lie below that, that uh, xi is in the class, in the set of, or subset, I should say, of moderately soluble molecules, and xj is in the subset of soluble molecules. But they lie on the solubility axis very close to one another. Now, if you think of another molecule that's moderately soluble, and I wish I could point to this, but it's, let's say, to the left edge of the moderately soluble class, uh, it would be quite different from Xi. In fact, Xi is much closer to Xj than it would be to this molecule. And similarly, if we had a molecule to way to the right-hand side, much more soluble in the soluble set. So what this illustrates, I hope, is that the problem when you generate a very sharp boundary, because things that are on one side of the boundary are treated one way, and things just on the other side are treated in another way. This is, in, in my view, the difficult with the cell-based chemical spaces. You have this boundary problem in spades because you have many boundaries, sharp boundaries. Anyway, next slide, please. All right, so here's how, how at least I'm attempting to resolve this boundary problem. And, and I do it through the use of fuzzy sets. So the green uh, sort of pyramid looking thing, triangle, is again the moderately soluble class and the blue triangle on the right is the solubility class. But you see they overlap with one another and that lighter blue area in the middle is just the intersection set or the overlap of these two sets. Now look at the same two compounds. So you'll see they can't be described by a single value. So X sub I, you see has two values. And if you look over to the right, you'll see that uh, MS means moderately soluble, and the A with the superscript S means soluble. So in the moderately soluble case for XI is 0.55. That's a degree to which it belongs to the soluble set. Okay, and it belongs also to the soluble, to, I'm sorry, moderately soluble set, and S refers to the soluble set. So there's two values here. And now if you look at, at X sub J, you'll see it's sort of the reverse of that because there's a symmetry here. So it belongs to the moderately soluble set degree 0.45 and to the soluble set degree 0.55, all right? But this is more general then. It's not, we're not using a single value to do this. And I'll show you how this obviously impacts the treatment of the rule of five. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. I wanted to say something a little before it's some more Einstein quotes because I think he's, he's not only a great scientist, he has a lot of good quotes. Uh, and that's, I want to say something about simplicity in science. If you can't explain it simply according to Einstein, you don't understand it. I probably many of you would agree with this. And also everything should be made, and I think this is important, as simple as possible, but no simpler kind of a challenging thing, but anyway. And also out of complexity, find simplicity. So I hope what I'm gonna show next will actually mirror some of these uh, quotes. Next slide, please. All right, what's the rule of five? And I say it's a triumph of simplicity because there's four rules. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, and these were developed by Chris Lipinski and his colleagues at Pfizer. And they published their work back in 1997, but the work was obviously done before that. It rose out of an analysis of the number of lipophilic compounds they seem to have in the Pfizer database or compound collection. So they came up with this set of rules and it's called the rule of five because you can see all the numbers here are, 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 are um, divisible by five. So uh, the first rule is no more than five hydrogen bond donors. Uh, so up to five, you're okay. Above five, it's not okay. And, and these, of course, are OH and NH groups. And then with respect to accept hydrogen bond acceptors, no more than 10. So these would be oxygens and nitrogens. It would be H bond acceptors. 
molecular weight, no more than 500. And many of you, I'm sure, are aware of this famous 500 number that's, that's, that's used uh, in the pharmaceutical industry for, for, comp, for looking at compounds, try to keep them under 500 molecular weight based on a lot of experience more than anything. And then lastly, log P. So no more than five. So obviously if you get even around five, but if you get bigger than five, you're going to more lipophilic compounds. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna show a formulation of this in a set theoretical way, because then I'll show you how I can generalize this using fuzzy sets and how this influences the values you get and how you soften this rule of five. Okay, so as you can see up in the very top, this is, uh, again, this is the bit vector. And you can see on the line right below that, that for a given property, the value is assigned one if it's above the threshold and a value of zero if it's equal to or less than the threshold. And these are for the four properties that I mentioned. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the graphical depiction of just what I have just said. So you can see for hydrogen bond donors, for example, there's a very sharp transition, a boundary, it's infinitely sharp. Um, and uh, the same thing for hydrogen bond acceptors, uh, molecular weight and log P. So this is a, a, a set theoretic view of the rule of five, okay? And so now I wanna show how we can soften this and it actually will produce more realistic values. But before that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wanna make an example here. So this is just a molecule I made up. Here's a bit vector you can see up above 0011. That means the first two properties, um, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors are not present. And um, log P and the molecular weight are, are violated. So usually uh, Lipinski and his colleagues called when something was above that, they call it a violation or they set a flag. And typically they, their working hypothesis was you don't want, you don't, you want to, it's not that you're going to throw them out of the collection, but you might as, give asterisk these compounds as compounds that maybe you should think about before, you, you know, using them too, too frequently in your research. And so this would be if you set two flags, so it would have a value of two. And you can see over here in the, in the, in the table that uh, be, these values that, that I put in in this fake molecule, okay? So it's, it's, it's values for the, uh, for, the, uh, for, um, for the set function are zero, zero, and one, and one. The weights I'm taking is equal at this point, but we will address that issue as well. So if I look at my aggregation function, which I showed you before, if I put these values in, I'll get a value of one half. And to get the count, count of these rule of five violations, uh, I, I calculate what I call the ROF score, which is the number of properties you consider, which is four in this case, times the value of the aggregation function. This is the weighted mean function. And you get a, you get a value of two. Now, you could just look at this table and count these. You don't have to do that. But in order to generalize this, I want to put this function in, as you'll see in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's another example. I want to show the contrast and show this boundary problem and how severe it is. So if you look at molecule two, this is another molecule that is made up again, and it has, a hydro has five hydrogen bond donors and 10 hydrogen bond acceptors. And since these lie below the threshold or at the threshold, they assign a value of zero for those that no flags are set. And also the molecular weight is 495, which is, which is below the threshold, uh, but close to the value for, the, for molecule one, which is, look, which is in the table on the left. And also a log P of 4.85, which again is the same. All of these would have zero flag set. So there's zero violations in a sense, uh, but nonetheless, these values are close between the two molecules. So you might expect these molecules to have somewhat similar values for the rule of five, but they, they do not, as you can see. The molecule on your right has a value zero 
overall value. The one on the left has value two. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we how do we deal with this and how do we fuzzify this? So what I'm showing you now, instead of these sharp functions that I showed you on a previous slide, I'm now having uh, I've I've modified these functions, and you can see uh, in terms of what I would call degrees of violation. So for hydrogen bonds, for example, if you're three or less, this would get a value of zero. And if you're seven, uh, more than seven, you would get a value of one. But instead of having a sharp uh, boundary between the, the violations at values of one and the non-violation zero, we have this linear uh, function that lies between it. And in the middle of that function is the value of five, which is the classic value that's used. So now you can see that if you have some values nearby, you'll get a value that's a fraction instead of being either zero or one. So this is gonna have a, a important effect on, I think, generating what are more realistic membership functions. And the same thing for hydrogen bond acceptors. There's again, a linear function, and this goes between seven uh, hydrogen bond acceptors and 11 hydrogen bond acceptors. And similarly, uh, in the two figures at the bottom of the slide, one of them uh, that has to do with molecular weight. So th this linear function is bounded on both sides of the 500 value, which was a sort of classic value. And also for log P similarly. So it's these linear functions now that allow us to fuzzify the problem. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here's here, I'm taking the same two molecules again, but now I'm using the fuzzy membership functions rather than the crisp uh, uh, functions, okay? And so what I get now for molecule one, remember in the past, the first two hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, that value was one for A sub one, um, uh, but now it's 0 0.25 and 0 0.50 and molecular weight was one in both, uh, for, and the log P was one in both cases, but now it's 0 0.60 and 0 0.50. And then for molecule two, in which all of the values were zero, now the value for hydrogen bond donating, donating capability uh, ability is 0.5. The hydrogen bond accepting is 0.75. Molecular weight is 0.45 and log P is 0.43. So it's certainly distinctly different. So as you'll see below that, uh, those are the fit vectors. And if I, and, and if I apply these um, aggregation, the weighted mean aggregation function using assuming equal weights on all of these. And I will address this issue of non-equal weights in a moment. I'll get a soft ROF score. And that's what the little S means in front there of 1.84 and 2.12. So on the next slide, uh, now you can see this in a diagram. So you can see, I think, now these two values are closer together. And, and I think this is certainly a much more rel uh, accurate representation than the classical representation. Because in one case, M1 would be in a more dubious class of molecules, one that you would have to look carefully on for further development, whereas M2 would be totally free of any problems. If you use the softer approach, you see they're, they're both kind of high and they also, um, and the, the whole reason this happens is because of that sharp boundary. Uh, and so anyway, this is, uh, okay, so let me go to the next slide, sorry. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so how do we develop a consistent set of weights? Because we can just guess at what these are and the weights have to sum to one, they're fractional values. But uh, I'm using a value, uh, uh, an approach based on what's called the analytic hierarchy process that was developed by Thomas Satie in the 1960s. Uh, it's a, it's a decision-making approach actually, but, but as you'll see, it allows you to count, calculate these kind of weights in an objective way. And there's a measure of how uh, consistent, how consistent these are, okay. So um, it, it, it's designed, as I indicate here, to cope with both objective and subjective data uh, and to select the best alternatives. 
it doesn't mean they're perfect, but you can assess this because it's based on pairwise comparisons. So if you have four entities and you want to generate the weights, it's a little hard to be sure you're always doing it in a consistent way. But if you do this based on pairwise comparisons, as I will show you, it's a more intuitive way and it's easier to make the selection. Doesn't mean they can be perfect, but it has a certain consistency aspect to it. And as I indicated, it allows for inconsistencies in judgments as well and provides a mean to improve this consistency. So next slide, please. So, okay, so how do we do this? We, it, it's based on what's called a dominance preference matrix and they're based on pairwise comparisons. So as you can see uh, along the, the, the rows of this matrix are hydrogen bond, you know, are these properties and the columns are these properties. And the way you look at it is when I look at uh, the sec, I wish I could point there, but unfortunately these slides are being shown in Mexico City and I can't use my, I can't use my laser pointer here. But anyway, if we look at hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors, you see the value A sub one, two. So this says how important you assume, you feel that the hydrogen bond donating and hydrogen bond accepting properties are with respect to each other. And notice there's a reciprocal relationship as you see on the right. So if, uh, well, let me go to the next one and then I can show you that. So hydrogen bond donating and molecular weight. Okay, I, I'm gonna, uh, no, I'm sorry, please go back. Uh, molecular weight. Uh, and then, so you can see down here, the molecular weight uh, is, is gonna be the reciprocal as it's with this relationship to hydrogen bond donating. And anyway, I will get, let, bring me the next slide now, and then I can show you, actually show you a little bit more about this. So what Sati did was he, he made an eigenvalue formulation of this, and this is a way, and I'll, I hope I convince you of this, of getting a consistent set of weights. Not the only possible weights, but a consistent set. So here is the matrix A, which I showed on the previous slide, and I'll show you the values that I'm using in this talk in the, on the following slide, but stay with this slide for a moment. And the V are the, Vs are the eigenvectors, and the lambda max is a principal eigenvalue. This, because the, of this relation, re, reciprocal relationship, that matrix A is called a reciprocal relationship, and it has an interesting property that all the values, eigenvalues except one are zero, and that uh, the lambda max is the maximum eigenvalue, it's the only non-zero eigenvalue. And the principal eigenvector V, you can see on the right for these, and ba basically then, if I look at this ratio that you see at the bottom of the slide, I can use the eigenvalues, um, I mean the eigenvector component values as a way to gain weights. And these weights will satisfy as they should, the sum of them should equal one, which, which in fact they do. All right, next slide. Now you can see what I actually chose. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry, that'll be the following slide. Stay with this slide for a moment. This is how you talk also about the transitivity and consistency of judgment. So transitivity, if A is, is related to B and B is related to C, if this is a transitive relation, A should be related to C as well. So if you see up here on the top that AIJ and AJK uh, would equal IK if you have consistency, if this is, this is a consistent value. All right, so what, what he did was take the ratio of these weights that we calculated, as I indicated on a previous slide, take those ratios, that generates this matrix A with the squiggle on top, which is not necessarily equal to the matrix, uh, matrix A, it's close to it, okay? And you can see if you use those elements that you will get transitivity, the line right below that shows that. And also if we look to the right and we look at this matrix, you can see that the eigenvectors are related. These are just the normalized components of the eigenvectors of the equation of the matrix A, and the eigenvalue is N. So using this information, Sati developed this formula. So what he calls the con consistency index, which you see it near the middle of the, of the slide, CI equals lambda max minus N, over n minus one. So those n's and the lambda max, those are eigenvalues. 
All right, so that's the consistency index, looks somewhat like a correlation. And what he uses to measure the consistency is what he calls the consistency ratio, as you see to the right of that, where it's the consistency index over what he calls the random index. And the random consistency index you'll see at the bottom of the slide <clears throat> is, is based on doing a lot of simulations with sets of objects which could be of different numbers. So one, you see one through 10. What we're dealing with, we have four properties or four objects we're dealing with. And the value for random consistency, this is done after doing many, many simulations and looking at the average for these multi, uh, many simulations. So the random consistency index for four objects or four properties, as, as is our case, is 0.9. So the idea is that the what Sate says is that if the consistency index ratio with the random index is less than 0.1, then you have a consistent set of weights. Now, as I say, you could there could be other sets as well, but at least the set you have is consistent. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so here, here finally, I'm, I probably should have done this earlier, but now I'm showing you the matrix and the choices I made to generate the set of weights that I will use. All right, so you can see in this matrix, of course, the diagonals are going to be one because the things are, are uh, the preference for something in itself is, is one. All right, so now look at hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors on the first row. The value, we're taking those as equally important. Going to the next column now, molecular weight, I'm saying hydrogen bond donating is only a fifth as important as molecular weight. Now look down at the bottom of the first column, and this is the reciprocal character. You can see that molecular weight, uh, which is, is considered five times as important as hydrogen bond donate. So you look up that column to what it is, and it's hydrogen bond donation. You can see over here, that uh, molecular weight uh, is uh, three times as important as log P, okay? And, uh, and if you look to the uh, kid, uh, diagonal to that, you can see that log P is only a third as important as molecular weight. So these are, this is a reciprocal character. And if you compute the uh, consistency index and you look at the random index, we get a number of 0 0.056, which is less than 0 0.1. So at least from Sati's approach to this, these weights that we chose were consistent at least. It doesn't mean, and I'm only showing you one possible set. Uh, obviously there could be other sets, but I think this is a reasonable set. Anyway, ne uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what I took was the same two molecules I did before, but now I put in this new set of weights. So these are, so if you look in the third column on each, on each of the molecules, these are the fit values, all right? Uh, and then to the right of that are the weights. Before, remember, they were all equal, but now we have these other weights. And so what we do is we recalculate those same numbers. And you'll see now that the soft rule of five score is, uh, is 2.13 and the soft rule of five score for molecule two is 1.90. So there again, they're still close. And if we look at the next slide, we'll see what these relations are. So they, they sort of shifted position, but in both cases, and if you try other weighting functions that are reasonable, you'll get something similar. The point is both these molecules, their properties are quite similar, but in the classic ROF, it's a simple theory and it's quite useful, but in the classical case, uh, these are really treated somewhat differently or view, viewed differently for sure. Okay, so here, so now let me provide on the next slide, I wanna talk about some actual drugs. So we took 12, about 1200 compounds from drug bank uh, and we processed these and removed some quote unfavorable compounds. You all know what those are like, right? So on the next slide, uh, okay, this is just an example. These are histograms that show the distribution of property values for the four properties that, uh, okay, that, I, that I'm uh, of interested in, hydrogen bond donating, accepting molecular weight and log P. And you can see, as I've indicated on these four figures, where these thresholds are. 
So you can see that most of the values uh, lie below the thresholds, which is good. It means that most, most of the drugs, but it also shows you that some drugs probably violate the classical rule of five. And I will show you some distinct examples in a moment. Anyway, next slide, please. Okay, so this now is calculating, I think there was about slightly more than a thousand drugs in what our sample was. And this is an example of calculating the rule of five, the crisp rule of five, the soft, and then the weighted soft. And so that's what's depicted on this figure. And you can see certainly in the so soft compared to the crisp that there's a lot of intermixing of these. Some, some of them, when you soften them, go up, some go down, but they all mix up together. And, uh, but I think as I showed on some previous, you know, these, these were not real compounds, but they could be real, they weren't unusual, they could be real compounds. What I showed there was that uh, the softened methods tend to get values, I think, that are more realistic because molecules that look alike with similar properties turn out to look similar on the soft and the weighted soft ROF scales. So this is for that whole set. On the next slide, uh, okay, on the next slide, I'm showing six drugs uh, and I, I, I like down at the bottom, I see Lipitor is kind of interesting because Lipitor has a molecular weight that lies is, is above 500 and it also has a log P that, so these uh, red lines underneath show violations of the classical rule of five, okay? And so what you can see here too is, uh, you, you can see uh, the third column from the far right are the values for the crisp rule of five, the traditional rule of five. And the next two columns, one is for the soft rule of five and the other is the weighted one. And you can see they're, they're somewhat similar, except in not in all cases. And I will show you a, a picture in just a moment that, sh you know, that, that shows this in, a, in an overall view. So, um, uh, okay, so let me go to the next slide and it will show a picture of this. So this is that same kind of diagram that shows hard, soft, and soft uh, ROF with, with these uh, varied weights. And you can see that uh, the, weight, the weighting system here is somewhat has split these out a bit. Uh, and, uh, but it also shows you that um, even with high values of the rule of five, no matter how they're calculated, uh, these are all drugs. So sometimes lipophilic compounds can make very good drugs. Anyway, this uh, I, I submit that, and, and this was used actually by my colleagues that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, uh, when they were at translational genomics to purchase compounds. So we were using the soft rule of five rather than the rule of five as a basis for looking at compounds that might be purchasable or should be purchased. Okay, so let me conclude with uh, the next slide or the next couple of slides. So how do we extend the method? Uh, okay, so maybe this is going past the notion of simplicity, uh, but just a little bit. <clears throat> and so what I'm calling the rule of five plus, you could add other properties and, and they could be integrated in a very seamless way. And properties that would be relevant, I think to certainly biopharmaceuticals, uh, biopharmaceutics would be something like uh, as I've indicated over on the, the right of the diagram, the PSA, the polar surface area, is also a good measure for biopharmaceutical properties. The number of rotatable bonds, usually we try in, in the pharmaceutical industry, at least, to get molecules that are not too flexible, that have low entropy, their conformational entropy is low. Um, and also the last one is the, um, some index of molecular complexity. So th these could be added very seamlessly. And, and the next slide would just show even a further, so I, I'm sort of going away from the simplicity notion, but I'm just showing that this particular approach is easily extended to include other properties and you could deal with ADME properties uh, as, as well as the other properties that I've talked about. So with that, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, uh, the question is, what's next? Uh, uh, how do we, and one of the things would be, how do we obtain optimal membership functions? Okay, and so, uh, and then the next, another issue would be, 
uh, how we, and, and you could change those functions that, that generate the membership function that I show you. I gave one thing, but I will say that in general, in fuzzy mathematics, those kinds of functions, the final results you get are, pr are, are pretty robust in terms of if you change those functions a little, it does, does very little to the final results you get. So they're kind of uh, stable. Uh, then how do we obtain optimal weights? That's another question. I just showed you one, one approach and one example. And then uh, also extending this to these other properties. And last slide, or not last slide, but the now, this is the end. And one more slide to show you, because uh, everybody shows a slide of where they live and this is where I live. And this is a beautiful shot of the Sonoran Desert in Southern Arizona. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to entertain questions. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for your nice lecture. And now we do have uh, time for, for questions. If anybody in the Zoom uh, wants to open the, the, the mic, feel free to do so or type your questions in the chat. Uh, so uh, Jerry, I have I have one question. We know that the physical chemical properties of approved drugs are changing over time. So I think, uh, well, I mean, what, what's your opinion on this softening rule of five with kind of the new and updated set of, let's say, drug-like compounds? Yes. Uh, are you talking about the physical property values uh, are, yes. are changing? Well, I think you just, you, uh, what what I would how I would address that is you have to recalculate these things every so often, uh, just to be sure that you know you're you're using the the most uh, the best property values for the different properties that are being assessed. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, Dr. Martinez, you you have a you can open your yeah. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Jerry. Very nice talk. Great to hear you and see you in this uh, conference. So I just have like a general question. Um, so connecting with the, the, the lecture that Professor Gasteiger gave like two days ago, like about these uh, different um, sets of molecules beyond um, drugs. drugs. Yes. So, so this like a rule of five and the fussiness, I guess uh, should be applicable also to other data sets, right? Like if, if we were interested on working on pesticides or food chemicals. So all this theory just to generalize could be applied to any set of molecules uh, beyond uh, drugs. What, what do you think? Yeah, and the other, the other thing with that is that uh, these were properties that they, that they thought were important for drugs, but it could be for other types of compounds, you might wanna have different property sets. So what I would say is this is at least an approach to the problem, but the problem, but the approach could be modified to take account of uh, molecules that are for different purposes so that are not to be drugs. So you mm -hmm. might want to choose different properties. So I think it's the basic framework is, is pretty, uh, it could be used in many different uh, situations. Right, right, right. And just another, like very, yeah. is, is, general question as well. So in, in this aspect of having a, like a different sets of molecules for other purposes. So I guess like having a rather, another set of rules for other types of compounds, like more specifically for natural products or like inorganic compounds. What do you think? Would it be best to have like a general set of, uh, of compounds like with um, um, uh, biological activity and have some rules or maybe focus on uh, a different types of compounds. For example, like inorganic compounds are quite different. Yeah. And I don't know, like doing like um, this type of rules for that specific compounds would be maybe not that, that great because we don't have so many. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think if you're looking at different classes of compounds, you might want to take different properties. Because for example, if you're looking at inorganics for some entirely different function, uh, I think, you know, you, uh, maybe I'm, I'm being redundant here, but I would say I would look at different properties. 
because there'd be mm -hmm. some crystal properties that might be very relevant. And I'm not sure how you formulate it, but I think, you know, if you think about it, it could be formulated, but I like the soft approach though. I don't like to say something has to be above something or below something with a sharp boundary. I think you can see many examples of this in science where when you have sharp boundaries, it's always a problem. Because mm -hmm. when you have, and this is what I said in cell-based chemical spaces, uh, where you have you have tons of boundaries because you have all these cells and every cell interface is a boundary and molecules on either side of that boundary can be very similar, but yet they're treated entirely differently. So anyway, so I, so I guess my main message is thinking about softening things. It really has a lot of advantages because I think you'll get a better representation of whatever problem you're studying. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Karina. Thank you, Jerry. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, well, thank you so much. There are more questions in the chat, but uh, I think we need to keep uh, in, in track with the program. So, Jerry, thanks again so much for your, your lecture. If you have some time, just address some uh, questions and comments in the chat, please. So now we're gonna to move to uh, our next presentation. This is from Dr. Ramon Alain Miranda Quintana. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Miranda Quintana. Uh, he majored in radiochemistry in the Higher Institute of Technologies and Applied Sciences and obtained his PhD in chemistry from the University of Havana in Cuba. After research appointments in McMaster University in Canada, he won a York Science Fellowship to work in York University as a postdoctoral scholar, where he won the 2019 Polanyi Prize in Chemistry. He then joined the Department of Chemistry at the University of Florida in the US as an assistant professor, where he was also a member of the Quantum Theory Project. He is also a member. His research interests include the development of ab initio electronic structure methods to study strongly correlated systems and developing efficient similarity-based tools for data science applications in chemistry and the biomedical sciences. He recently proposed the extended similarity indices and his group is applying them in drug design, the study of chemical libraries, analysis of biological ensembles, clustering, image mass spectroscopy, among others. Uh, Professor Ramon, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, we can see your, your, your slides. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jose Luis. Uh, thanks to everyone like watching live in, in Zoom. Thanks to everyone watching in YouTube. Uh, I apologize for not, uh, for not being able to, to share with you, but the, the internet connection is... Uh, is such a uh, it's, 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 it's unstable, so I'd rather be I uh, just you guys like uh, see, seeing the slides and, and, and watching the, the presentation. So, uh, as uh, so Sosalis was mentioning, I'm going to be talking today about one of the, the, the main lines of research in my group, which is uh, new similarity indices. <clears throat> so, the study of molecular similarity. So, uh, we develop something called the extended similarity indices, which I'm going to be talking about in a second, and this all stems from the from the idea that, which is something people have been like uh, using since like, uh, since, 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 since like alchemy times, which is the fact that similar molecules have similar properties, and it's like so fitting that I'm talking uh, after Jerry, because like this is perhaps the, he gave the, the most like a uh, Widely recognizable statement for this uh, for this principle, the, the similarity property principle. So the this is something quite intuitive that every chemist probably has used at least once in their life, and probably the example is the periodic table, which like by relating different compounds, different uh, uh, different uh, 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 atomic symbols, and uh, we essentially can and see the different the inner structure of the different chemical compounds. So the but the main issue that we have with this uh, similarity property principle is that how do we actually compare molecules? So if we have this like aromatic alcohol, is this molecule more similar to this aromatic molecule, or is this molecule more similar to this aliphatic molecule, but that also has this like alcohol functionality? 
So this is exactly the problem that we want to tackle. So how do we compare molecules and how do we compare molecules in a, in a, in a, in a really efficient setting? So for that, we are going to use one of the many possible ways of representing molecular structures, which is using what is known as molecular fingerprints. So essentially, what you do is that you are going to reduce the structure of the information of the, of the molecule and turn that into a binary vector, that is the vector of ones and zeros. So you have a property or you don't have a property. You have a certain like functional group or you don't. And with these representations, there are several natural ways of quantifying molecular diversity, sorry, quantifying molecular similarity. And all of them are basically based on the same principles. So first of all, we would like to quantify how many on bits do we have between these two uh, molecular fingerprints. <clears throat> So in this case, we have two instances in which we have the same property in both molecules. We also want to quantify when we don't have the same property, when we have common or coinciding of bits between the two molecules. And by the same token, we want to see when do we have one property in one molecule, but that property is absent in the other. And these indicators, A, D, B, and C, it should be pretty obvious that we can interpret those as uh, similarities, as matches of similarity. In the case of A and D, that is when we have the same property, we don't have the same property. And in the case of B and C, a similarity, because in those cases, we essentially have a mismatch within the properties in the different molecules. So for that, then we can essentially combine this counter, if you want, in several different similar indices. So for instance, we have the like very, very famous Jakarta Nimoto index, which is essentially A divided by A plus B plus C, but we have like something like the soccer machine or the simple machine index, or even like nonlinear transformations like the Baron Urbani uh, index. So essentially what we have is functions that are usually monotonically increasing in A and D and monotonically decreasing in B and C. That is increasing A and D is going to increase the value of these indices and increasing B and C is going to decrease the value for these indices, which once again makes a lot of sense because as I say, it is uh, obvious or obvious that these guys quantify similarity and these guys quantify the similarity. So this is the, the, the standard, like the, the, the two main crash course on, on a binary similarity. The question that we asked like about a year ago is how to extend this if we want to compare n molecules. If we don't only want to see two molecules at a time, but if we want to compare n molecules at the same time, how do we define this similar and this similar counter? So the first step, I'm, I'm sort of like going to walk you through this process, like uh, essentially taking into account that there are several students in the audience. Um, like being this a new technique, I just want to like walk you like, walk you like a step by step as to how we can calculate this. So the first step is to define and calculate this counter. So this CMK essentially measures the number of times that we have K on bits when we have N molecules. So to see that quite easily in the case of two molecules, so A will be C22, that is we have two ones in the two molecules. D will be two zero, that is when we have zero ones in the two molecules and B plus C, are going to be the instances in which we have one one in the two molecules. Okay. Now the advantage of this like new notation of this new way of looking at the problem is that we can easily extend this to any number of molecules. So for instance, in this case, we are going to have one instance in which we're going to have four ones in four molecules, as you can see right here, two instances in which we're going to have three ones in four molecules. That is this column right here and this other column right here. And by this, by Essentially, like the same idea, one column in which we're going to have one one and a two columns in which we're going to have zero one. This one right here, and this one right here. So that is basically, uh, the, the, this is the key step to go from uh, binary comparisons to n eddy comparisons. That is comparisons in which we have an arbitrary number of molecules at the same time. It is easy to see that we are going to have, if we have n molecules, we are going to have n plus one of this sys because we are going to have from having n ones to having zero ones that is like n plus one possible uh, valid uh, value for this uh, for this uh, for these counters. Now, after we calculate this counter, we need to find a way to assign them to similarity or dissimilarity. For that, the first step 
is then to calculate these descriptors, these delta, which are essentially the absolute value of 2k minus n. Remember, n number of molecules, k number of ones in a given column. And this essentially, as I say, uh, said right here in the slide, is going to measure the degree of coincidence in a given, uh, in a given position. So for the case of four molecules, we can easily see that these values go from four to zero and then increase once again to four because as you can see, the maximum for this function is going to be reach when k is equal to zero. That is, we have a perfect coincidence of zeros, or when k is equal to n, that is, we have a perfect coincidence of ones. And then this is going to decrease showing some partial coincidence. With these descriptors already calculated, next we need to define a coincidence threshold that is essentially a threshold uh, signaling when we are going to have uh, a similarity or a dissimilarity. If we have a delta in K that is bigger than gamma, then we say that that counter we are going to take into account as a similarity counter. For instance, and a bit more precise, if 2K minus N is bigger than gamma, then we say that this counter is a one similarity because it's essentially uh, the coincidence is uh, given predominantly by the presence of several ones in that column. By the same reasoning, if now N minus 2K is bigger than gamma, then this counter is going to be a zero similarity because we are going to have a bigger amount of zeros in that, uh, in that column. And of course, if this is not true, then we are going to have a dissimilarity. The lowest possible value for gamma is easily that we can see is going to use uh, the residue of the y and the number of molecules by two. And essentially, if we pick this gamma as our coincidence threshold, what we are saying is that n strings will be similar at a given position when more than half the width at that position have the same value. That is, if we have sort of like a predominant of ones or zeros, we are going to count that as a similarity. As an example of this, once again, this is just a quick summary of what we saw in the previous slide. That is when we have one similarity, zero similarity or dissimilarity. And once again, going back to example, this toy model of four molecules. In this case, the minimum possible value for gamma is going to be zero because we can exactly divide four by two. And these are going to be the different counters that we are going to have in the example. So to see that in more detail, so notice, for instance, that we are going to have these three different positions in which we are going to have more ones than zero. So we can we count those as one similarity. We are going to have also these three positions in which we are going to have a predominant a predominance of zeros over ones, and that means that those are going to be considered as zero similarities. And we are going to have these two positions in which we have a perfect balance between ones and zeros, and then we're going to count that those as, uh, as dissimilarity measures. Now, it is obviously not enough, and let me backtrack a little bit, for instance, let me focus on the one similarity. It is obviously not enough to just identify these positions as uh, corresponding to one similarity. Because obviously this position in which we have a perfect match of four ones is going to indicate a quote unquote higher similarity value than this position I should indicate a higher similarity value than this position in which we have some uh, appearance of zeros. So then we essentially what we need to do next is we need to find a way to weight how these different counters are going to appear in the final expressions because we need to take into account that we might have a higher percentage of ones and zeros that and that should indicate a higher similarity in a given moment. So then the final step is essentially, as I said before, to penalize partial coincidence. And for that, we introduce these weight functions. As you can see right here, we have weight functions that weight the similarity for the similarity counter, and uh, weight functions that weight the dissimilarity to the dissimilarity counter. The general properties of these functions are really natural and really easy to, to realize uh, what we're doing with them. And that is basically for the similarity weight functions, they should uh, achieve a maximum when uh, the argument is equal to n, the total number of molecules, because there is no higher similarity than that, and they should be monotonically decreasing, like decreasing the number of uh, of tokens of the same value should decrease the, the weight of these functions. Uh, by a similar argument, the dissimilarity weight functions, they should achieve their maximum at the lowest possible for gamma, that is when uh, n at n mod 2, and they should increase when we increase their arguments. There are obviously infinitely many, many possibilities for these functions. Uh, the one that we have tried the most in our research is essentially just a, 
really simple uh, fractional weights, as you can see right here. Uh, but there are other many possibilities, and we are starting to, to, to play with that now in the group. It's essentially seeing how changing the different wave functions is going to impact the, the calculation of these similarities. For the particular case, once again, of this toy model in which we have only four molecules, these are the different similarity, uh, the different wave functions for the similarities and the only wave function for the dissimilarity. So now with all of this, we have essentially all the ingredients in place to define the New York Synergy similarity method. And this is the simplest part of all the process, because essentially what we need to do is that whenever we have an A that is a coincidence of ones in the binary descriptor, now we substitute that by just the sum over the one similarity countess multiplied by the corresponding uh, Uh, so then you, you can see the, uh, you see that you just need to take into account all the possible one similarities and then multiply that by the, uh, by the corresponding wave functions. The same goes for the dissimilarity counters. So whenever you have a D, now you're going to have the sum over the zero similarities times the weight. And whenever you have B plus C, that is the dissimilarity, you're going to have the dissimilarity counters times the corresponding weights. So if this was the expression of this, if this is expression for the standard or the below jakarta Nimoto index, this is going to be another expression for the extended jakarta Nimoto index. So once again, A, A, you see right here, the one similarity, the sum over the one similarity and the sum over the difference. And you can... Uh, Ramon, we cannot hear you any longer. So I think Dr. Ramon locked lock off. Probably he will come back to the Zoom session moment early. Yeah, it seems that he lost the, the connection. We can uh, wait a few minutes to see if he can join, else uh, we have uh, the video because he rec recorded his presentation. Okay, we're gonna now play the the video that, that he recorded. Hi everyone, I apologize for not being there in person. Actually, if you are uh, seeing this uh, this recording, that means that uh, I had some technical difficulties. Uh, here in fewer because I'm visiting my family. So I decided to pre record this lecture just in case I wouldn't be able to hear it like at the same time that, that everyone else. Uh, but I still I wanted to, to talk to you and show you what we have been working on uh, in our group. So, first of all, thanks to Jose Luis for the invitation to participate in this uh, truly amazing symposium. Um, it's an honor to wait, uh, speaking between like a professor Mayor and, and Mayorat, just like that. Two of the biggest influences on my on my work on uh, comparisons and molecular similarity. 
Uh, and we have further ado, I'm going to uh, talk today about extend the similarity indices. Uh, that's been a, a huge project, one of the main projects going on in, in our group here at the University of Florida <clears throat> that deals with like new ways of comparing molecules. Right? That is like new ways of uh, telling how similar to are many, many molecules at the same time. Uh, the latter of the talk is extending similarity analysis. Uh, and we'll go from pairs of molecules to the chemical space and a little bit on that. So as you might have guessed from the title of the, of the talk and from uh, what I have said uh, up to this point, uh, I'm going to be talking about chemical similarity. And um, this is all motivated by the similarity property, by the similarity property uh, principle, which essentially states that similar molecules should have similar properties. And I like to have this like features of like famous alchemists. Uh, essentially, it will state that this is a principle that I'm pretty sure every chemist has used at some point in their lives. So it makes a lot of sense. And this is actually the ideal principle uh, behind some of the towering achievements of chemistry. For instance, the, the predictable is just nothing more than just like identifying similarities between properties in elements and this essentially grouping those two words according to like similar behavior. And the same can be extended. Uh, to uh, model dog design, uh, scanning uh, databases, and, and so on and so on. Then uh, the key is that even though this is a really fundamental principle in chemistry, there is a still the this is still leaves the door open essentially to how do we quantify molecular similarity. So, given these three molecules, for instance, how do we decide which is more similar to this like uh, aromatic alcohol right here? Is just benzene because it's also an aromatic molecule, or is this other like aliphatic molecule but that has an OH group? So, this sort of ambiguity is something that uh, we want to try to tackle. Um, and beyond that, we want to be able to perform these uh, molecular comparisons in a really, really efficient way. There are many ways of comparing molecules. You can do that based on the different fragments, on the different molecular properties, on the different scaffolds, and like the common uh, functional groups, and so on and so on. The main way that we're going to be focusing on today is a really powerful one. And that is one that translates the molecular structure into some form of, of a binary vector known as molecular fingerprints, in which we essentially encode the information of the molecule using bits on or off one or figures. Then, once we have this really convenient mathematical uh, representation of the molecular structure, we can proceed to compare molecules based on this representation. So, for instance, I'm yeah, using like a, and there are several notations to do this. I'm going to be using the one that I'm more familiar with, and one that is like actually very popular. People usually calculate this indicator A, which essentially counts the number of own bits between the two strings that, you, uh, that you're going to be comparing. And in this case, you have two positions in which you have two ones in each molecule. You can also identify those positions in which you're going to have common off bits, that is, you have a zero and a zero. And in this case, right here, you have three of those. And obviously, you can have also the number of times in which you have an on bit in the first molecule and off bit in the second, and vice versa, and off in the first one, and an on in the second. With these indicators, it is pretty clear, which should be pretty intuitive, that increasing A and B should indicate similarity. That is, we have more common properties or the absence of a common property in the two molecules, and that increasing B and C should indicate the similarity between the molecules. It makes then a lot of sense that the vast majority of similarity methods that we can define using these indicators are monotonically increasing functions of A and D or D, depends on like if you use uh, A, D, or only one of them. And they are monotonically decreasing functions of B and C. That is, increasing A and D should increase the similarity function, and increasing B and C should decrease the similarity function. And as I said, there are many ways of doing this from the very famous and sometimes overused Jacquard Tanimoto, or simply the Tanimoto index, to the circumvention of simple matching to the Baron Hermione Wusser and like a plethora of other that are pretty, very common in the world uh, in chemical informatics. Now, this essentially, this simple picture relies on the fact that we have two and only two of these things. And if we want to measure distance or similarity with two, with two molecules, we are implicitly thinking about doing this between two molecules. So the thing is like when you're measuring distance, 
between points, you are implicitly considering the information distance between only two points, between two cities, for example. Now, the question that we ask is how we can extend, uh, hence the name extended similarity, how we can extend this framework to the case in which we have an arbitrary number of volumes. So say we have not, not two, but let's say three, four, or 10 million or 10 billion molecules. Can we compare that? Can we compare those sets? Can we compare all those molecules at the same time? And essentially, what we need to do is we need to define similarity. And this similarity context that, in a way, may make what we saw is like A, B, and B plus C in the previous section, and then being able to apply that to cases in which we have more than two uh, binary strings. So, to do this, we presented uh, roughly like a year and a half ago a simple algorithm in which the starting point is identifying or calculating these counters, this C and K, which essentially counts the number of times in which you are going to have K on bits in a set of N bit strings. So in the standard case of uh, binary indices, in which we only have two sets of, uh, in which we only have two molecules, A for the coincidence of two ones will be identified by C22. D, that is the coincidence of two zeros, is going to identify as C20. And then we cannot distinguish between B on C and C because essentially uh, we don't care about the order which we compare these, uh, these molecules. So we can only calculate B plus C in this particular case. And this will correspond to a number of times in which you will have one one between two molecules. Now, the advantage of looking at this problem in this way is that we can easily extend this to cases in which you have an arbitrary number of molecules. So if we have n molecules, we're always going to have n plus one of these indices. It's really easy to see because we're going from having n ones to having zero ones, that is like n plus one possibility. So for instance, in this case, <clears throat> there is going to be one instance in which we're going to have four ones. There are going to be two instances in which we're going to have three ones, you can see this column right here and this column right here, there are going to be two instances in which we're going to have two ones only, right here and right here, and there are going to be two instances in which we're going to have four zeros and one instance in which we're going to have only one one. And in that way, once again, we can basically extend this idea of like A, quote unquote A, B, and B plus C, that we support the two, uh, two molecule case to any number of molecules. The next step is to calculate these descriptors, these um, delta and k, which essentially measure the degree of coincidence. This is a really simple thing to calculate. It's essentially when you have k ones, this delta is going to be equal to the absolute value of 2k minus n. And as I say, the importance of this is that this is going to allow you to calculate the degree of, like, estimate the degree of coincidence between uh, a given column in this, like, a matrix of. Uh, molecular fingerprints. So for the case in which n is equal to four, it's like toy model that we have been like playing with uh, up to this point. This delta is going to go from four to two to zero, and then it's going to increase once again and two, uh, from two to four. <clears throat> the key, why we do this is because then we're going to define, or we need to define a coincidence threshold that is essentially going to tell you when you are going to consider that something is similar or not. So in more mathematical terms, if you choose a gamma and then delta and k is bigger than gamma, then c and k is going to be a similarity context. More specifically, if 2k minus n is bigger than gamma, then c and k is going to be a one similarity. That is, you're going to have a predominant number of ones or on bits in a given column by the same token. If n minus 2k is bigger than gamma, then C and K is going to be a zero similarity. That is, you're going to have a prevalence of zeros in a given column. And finally, if this is not the case, then you're going to have a similarity. It is pretty easy to see that the lowest possible value for gamma is equal to N mod two, that is the residue of dividing the number of molecules uh, by two. That is like zero if you have a given number of molecules, one if you have another number of molecules. And choosing gamma in this way is going to essentially uh, guarantee that you're going to be measuring the molecules in the most similar way possible. So this you're going to have like the lowest possible threshold to, con to consider uh, that those molecules are going to be similar. 
uh, by the same idea, the largest possible value for gamma is going to be n minus one. And that is your own, in that case, you're only going to consider that a given bit position is going to count as a similarity if you have only n ones or n zeros in the position. That is if you have perfect coincidence in a given column. Then, as I said before, you can easily uh, identify different uh, counters as one zero uh, similarities or dissimilarities in the toy model that we have been uh, considering so far. That is in the case in which we have only four molecules. Gamma is going to be equal to zero. That is like uh, four can be exactly divided by two. <clears throat> which means that we can identify C44 and C43 as one similarities. Makes perfect sense. You have more ones than zeros in those columns. Then C41 and C40 are going to be zero similarities. Once again, makes perfect sense because you have a predominant of zeros or of bits in those positions. And you're going to have two positions in which you have exactly the same amount of ones and zeros. And hence, you cannot identify that as a similarity or dissimilarity. How do we see that? Right here, well, we see we have these one similarity, these positions correspond to one similarities. These positions in blue, they correspond to zero similarities. And then in the extrema, we have these two positions that they correspond to these similarities. Now, obviously, we should have a way, or it makes uh, some sense that we will need to, that we will want to distinguish between zero for, uh, C44 and C43. They both correspond to one similarity, as you can see right here, but it makes, uh, it is uh, like intuitive to think that this position should represent a higher similarity than this one, because right here we have a perfect coincidence of one, that is every single molecule has that attribute in the set. Meanwhile, only 75% of molecules have uh, this same attribute in these two positions. So to introduce uh, this notion into a theory, we propose to define what we uh, know as, what we name uh, wave functions, which essentially penalize partial coincidence. So whenever you have a one or a zero similarity, but that is not associated with a perfect coincidence of one from zero, and there's going to be in the vast majority of cases, by the way, then you should distinguish between that those degrees of similarity, depending on the number of ones and zeros. So you will have a wave function for the similarity context, and you should have a wave function for the dissimilarity context. These wave functions must satisfy some really, really simple properties. That is uh, f of s n, that is the similarity when delta n k is equal to n, should be equal to the maximum, because and that indicates perfect coincidence. And then whenever we decrease the argument of this, of this function, the function should decrease because once again, that means that we are mixing ones and zeros more and more. So the similarity should decrease. By a similar reasoning, FD, that is the weight function for the dissimilarity, is essentially going to have a maximum whenever we, have, we hit the lowest possible value. That is when we have the perfect mixing between one and zero, that is the highest possible dissimilarity. And then whenever we increase this argument, this function should decrease because that means that we are increasing the ordering. We are adding or more ones or more zeros and then biasing that column towards having or not having a given property. There are obviously many different ways of satisfying these two properties. The simplest ones that we have been considering so far are these uh, simple fractions that is only dividing delta nk by n and these like uh, differential fractions. These are going to guarantee that you satisfy these uh, monotonic properties, and they are also going to guarantee that when uh, this maximum, these functions are going to be equal to one. Then we can easily calculate, for instance, for the particular case of this, like uh, for the four uh, fingerprints that we have been uh, considering so far, that when we have a perfect coincidence of one or a perfect coincidence of zero, these two are going to be equal to one. Whenever we have some mismatch between ones and zeros, the value is going to be less than one. And when we have like, quote unquote, perfect dissimilarity, this uh, function is also going to be equal to one. But in this case, corresponds to a dissimilarity weight. Now, what is left is to combine everything into uh, the next leg similarity indices. So whenever we have an A, that is the coincidence of ones, now we are going to have the sum over all the one similarity context times 
the corresponding wave function whenever we had a zero similarity, that is a D. Now we're going to have the sum over all the zero similarity contexts, once again, multiplied by the corresponding wave functions. And finally, whenever we had B plus C in an index, we are going to have the sum over the corresponding D similarity contexts and the corresponding D similarity wave functions. Now to generate the next similarity indices is the procedure is as simple as you literally just substituting these new quantities in expression for the for indices. So for instance, if this is the expression for the like the standard Jaggart and Emoto index, now if we put like the sums over the one similarities and the dissimilarities in the numerator and denominator, we get the expression for the Jaggart and Emoto index. The same goes for so-called measure and so on and so on. So far, we have implemented 19 generalized uh, uh, extended similarity indices uh, in different variants, including weights in the denominator or not, uh, what we call the non operator of the weighted versions of the indices. We have different symmetric or anti symmetric trim or uh, asymmetric treatments of one and zero similarity and many different variants. All of this you can find for uh, absolutely like a like free to the public, like open access, completely open access in this repository in which we have been updating with more and more modules corresponding to our applications. Some of them I'm going to be talking about in a second, uh, about different applications related to the to smart similarity indices. Um, there are diversity features, there are clustering tools, there are tools to analyze uh, molecular dynamic simulations, uh, and so on and so on. As I say, feel free to go to this repository and uh, yeah, try the methods that we have been like, uh, implemented so far. So this is the basic theory of uh, of how to calculate or how to define this standard similarity indices. The question, like the obvious question that most of you should be asking at this point, is uh, yeah, should like this? This seems nice. Uh, this is like a, a cute little new mathematical framework to calculate similarity. But, but why? Why do we even bother with this like idea of like calculating many things at the same time? So the main motivation behind the original formulation of these indices was to calculate such similarity or essentially to estimate, being able to estimate chemical diversity. So the standard approach to do this is that given a set of molecules, and here I'm only representing three molecules in a set, but imagine that you're doing this for like 10,000, 20,000, right, 2 million molecules. So you have a number of molecules in a set, and then you need to partition essentially this into every possible subset in which you have two molecules. We calculate the distance between two molecules because once again, when you are using the all or the traditional similarity indices, you can only calculate similarity within two points at the same time. And then you will average all these values and that will give you an idea of the chemical diversity of that set. The key problem with this is that even if you can calculate the similarity with two molecules in a really, really efficient way, you will still need in the order of n squared of those calculations to calculate the similarity of the whole set. That is, uh, essentially, the problem of choosing two objects out of set of n, that is like n choose two, or like n times minus one divided by two, which is basically going to scale as n squared. So this is something that you can manage for tens of thousands of molecules, but once you get to like millions or billions of molecules, this demands like a huge computational effort. And it's definitely something that we want to avoid if we want to keep exploring larger and larger sections of chemical space. The solution, with this like near extender or n uh comparisons is that now to calculate the similarity between n molecules independent of n, we can do that in one step. We just define new ways of calculating similarity in which you can combine any number of molecules. You can make a partition this set into any number of subsets. You can just straight up like estimate the or calculate the diversity of this set uh, in one step. This has an obvious like a conceptual uh, beauty to it in the sense that you don't need the step of, of partition in the set. And this also implies that you're going to have really nice scaling because now instead of the time depending quadratically with the number of elements of the set, the time that takes to compare a set of molecules is going to increase linearly with the number of molecules. This is an unprecedented efficient uh, scaling and is uh, one of the key features of the advantages of the new smart similarity indices over this, uh, the traditional binary similarities when you are applying this to large, to large generalization. Notice that uh, in the X 
axis. I'm talking about billions of molecules. And uh, for instance, if this is just in a regular laptop. Comparing 10 billion molecules, like estimating the chemical diversity of a set of 10 billion molecules that only took roughly 18 minutes on a single laptop. If you want to push this and use like a uh, like a really efficient uh, cluster, like the one that we have here in Florida, we can push this number of molecules to the order of like 100 billion and probably a bit more. And once again, this is something that is completely out of reach uh, if you want to use only binary similarity. So this is uh, the first key practical, practical like a, a advantage of the similar similarity indices. But beyond this higher efficiency at the time of estimating the similarity of many molecules, there are other practical advantages that in some cases are also related to the fact that we can perform this comparison in a really efficient way that I want to talk to you today. So the first of those that we are, yes, uh, sorry, it's just like indicating the, the linear scaling of the, of the method. So the first application, one of the first applications that we explore beyond just like, hey, this is dramatically faster than what people have been using so far is in the problem of diversity selection. That is given a set of molecules, even like thousands of millions of molecules, how do you sample that set in a way that you obtain a subset that is as diverse as possible. So usually you start from a randomly selected molecule, and this is going to be the first step of the traditional uh, algorithms that we tested. It's also going to be the first step for the algorithm that we implemented. So in the traditional sense, you want to maximize the minimum binary dissimilarity. That is the, the traditional max main algorithm. So how does this work? Like in a simple pictorial way, if you select like, this set of molecules, and then you have these other molecules that you want to see which are now you're going to select to maximize the diversity of your set. You're going to calculate all the different binary similarities between the selected and the non-selected molecules. And you're going to pick the one that has the minimum value, uh, the maximum value for the minimum dissimilarity. However, Performing this calculation demands essentially computing the distance matrix for the whole set, which once again scales at n squared. So this has the potential to become uh, a parabolic scaling problem. So once again, we don't like if possible, we want to avoid something like that. And now uh, comes the algorithm that we propose, which is essentially just maximizing the standard similarity of the set that you're selecting. This max uh, and this algorithm. Once again, you start from a set of molecules that you already selected. And to see if you're going to add a new molecule, you just like calculate the like, similarity of this set. Or if you want to see if you want to introduce a new molecule, this set molecule right here, you are going to calculate the uh, standard similarity of this other set. And then you essentially pick the molecule that gives you the lowest possible. Uh, Standard similarity. So you want to minimize that uh, standard similarity. The other advantage of this is that we benchmark our method here in green with respect to the other methods, uh, essentially max main and max sum, which are like two uh, really powerful and really uh, popular uh, diversity selector, uh, diversity pickers. As you can see, when we try this, on different libraries, which have different properties. For instance, we started from a library of purposely diverse molecules, a library of randomly selected molecules, a library of molecules that are selected to be as similar as possible, and a library that is just composed from molecules that all have the same scaffold, like a triazole, as I like in a scaffold. We see that in all cases, our method is not only potentially faster because our method scales linearly with the number of uh, molecules selected. Also, our method consistently selects sets that are more diverse than those selected by the traditional binary algorithms. And this is the case even if we are selecting from a relatively modest set of compounds or from libraries that have like up to 100,000 uh, molecules. This increase in performance is even more noticeable when we apply this to a set of like a real set, like inhibitors of this uh, protein. And you can see that our method right here in green once again provides sets that are like up to like three or four times more diverse than those that you can obtain using maximum and maximum.
So not only can you select molecules in a faster way, you can also select molecules in a more diverse way. So the diversity picker that you uh, that you obtain from extremely similar indices is essentially faster and provides better results than the traditional binary ones. Another application, which is as I mentioned before, one of the uh, original motivations for this uh, for this new index is uh, that of quantifying chemical diversity. So when a set has a chemical diversity of one, that is a really simple thing to measure because that essentially means that you essentially have same copies of like just copies of the same molecule. By the same idea, when you have a set similarity of zero, that is really simple. That means that you can really interpret that as having molecules that have absolutely nothing to do with one another. They don't share any characteristic. Problem is that these two extreme cases are really difficult to, uh, to achieve. And more often than not, you're going to get a similarity value of like 0 0.72, 0 0.51, 0 0.46. And that in a vacuum is really difficult to evaluate. So there are many reports or like many people like wrongfully citing that like when you have a tiny model similarity of like more than 0.75, that means that your molecules are similar, but that depends on the type of molecules, depends on how you selected the molecules, depends on the representation, the fingerprint type, and many things. And you really shouldn't take one of those like pressure values for granted if you haven't done like a proper check in, the, in your set. However, this takes a lot of time and will be, should be nice to have a really clean and clear way of measuring chemical diversity that doesn't depend on you having like essentially to run this type of analysis whenever you change the fingerprint type, whenever you change the similarity index, or whenever you change your library. So, as I said, the stomach similarity is really convenient in the sense that we can calculate the similarity of a set in a really efficient way. As, an, as, I, as you see right here, we did this for the sync click library, changing the fingerprint type. Here we use max uh, or RDK fingerprints for different extended similarity indices. And the main issue is that even though we can calculate these numbers really, really quickly, even like changing the machine special and so on, these numbers are really hard, difficult to compare between each other. Notice that by changing the fingerprint type, the similarity values essentially decrease in all cases. So, if you say that a 0 0.8 or a 0 0.75 is a good similarity for the uh, cyclic database, then that means that this database is not similar at all when you do this comparison using RDK fingerprints. So once again, just looking at like the raw similarity values, even if similarity values is not going to give you a good measure of, of chemical diversity. The way to go about this is essentially to define or to consider the similarity, right? Similarity with respect to a given reference. So if you calculate this difference, which can be done in absolute terms or in relative terms, depending on how you calculate this delta, and then you put these values in a in a conveniently chosen uh, sigmoid function, you can get that these libraries have a relatively similar pattern, even if you change the um, the type of fingerprints. Here I'm taking, we, we took as reference the a set of approved drugs by the FDA. And you can see that these two plots look way more similar than these two plots right here. Right here, the, this blue line represents the 0.5 similarity uh, volume, which is just introduced for visual purposes because it means absolutely nothing. As you can see here, we, have, we are on top of 0.5. We are like definitely below 0.5. Now in this case, 0.5, has a clear meaning because being below 0.5 means that you are not as diverse as the reference. Meanwhile, being above 0.5 means that you are more diverse than the reference. Uh, we can even see that when we have sets that have like similar process, like in this case, like different sets of uh, proof drugs, the relative diversity of these sets is going to be essentially the same, meaning that uh, you can also identify, use this tool to essentially have like a, a really clear and clean way of identifying the, the potential uh, origin of different sets. A possible application for, for this that we're exploring right now, this is going to appear in uh, for the jobs, is to try to apply this tool to uh, in polypharmacology studies, essentially trying to relate different sets. On the same idea, like trying to expand on this idea, 
of being able to compare different sets and being able to uh, uh, represent uh, correlations between different sets. We have an extension that we published like relatively recently, like earlier uh, this year, that has to do with uh, chemical library networks. So uh, professors Mayor and Bayorot, they proposed the chemical spy networks in which essentially given a set, you will like draw different edges, you would represent that set using uh, graph elements in which every uh, vertex on the uh, graph is going to represent any mole a molecule and the different edges are going to be drawn depending on the similarity. Now we can extend this idea, but instead of having molecules as vertex, now we are going to have all data sets of vertices in these graphs. So for instance, this represents a collection of 19 different libraries com com uh, comprising more than 18 million molecules. And as, uh, as far as we could tell, the largest uh, chemical spice networks that we could find in the, in the literature had on the order of like 10 to five molecules. Now we're talking like in the order of like tens of millions, so like a bit more than that. And you can see that we can essentially see all the uh, connections, like how all these are already related in chemical spice. So if the chemical spice networks give you an insight of like the relations within a, a, a data set, these chemical library networks extend that idea. And now you can see relations between multiple data sets in chemical space. We can use the same tools as uh, Mayor and Biorad. We're using essentially uh, pruning different vertices and changing the edge threshold uh, to see how different libraries are going to be connected. And we see that we really quickly run into the issue of having essentially one central library in most cases and virtually losing all the information of the connection between the others. Another advantage of the similarity indices is that we can do this pruning in a way that is a bit more systematic because we can do it by changing the coincidence thresholds. For instance, this will be the coincidence threshold, the, sorry, the, the plots in which we're using the lowest possible coincidence threshold. Remember that this means that we are essentially measuring similarity at the highest possible value. Now, if we increase the coincidence threshold to win the 30% of data or like 50% or not, so on and so on, we see that many edges start to slightly fade away. And when we get to something as high as 90% of data being required to be like coincident to count that as a similarity, we can clearly identify once again, the uh, central structure of the library. So that must if you want the, the main library uh, according to our representation, but we don't lose the information regarding the connectivity of the other libraries of the set. So that is a, a, a really good uh, measure of essentially representing chemical space. Now, another uh, potential way of exploding this uh, idea of uh, SNX similarity in exploring molecular sets, not so much in the global level, but in the local level, is the ability of identifying the most important molecules in a set. <clears throat> so this is a classical problem in computer science. That is the problem of finding the middle of a set that is the central element of a set in which you basically want to identify that object that is the most similar to all of the other objects in the set. This usually demands an n square calculation, depending on like scaling on and the number of objects in the set. However, using a, a nice trick with a similarity, we can take down that scaling up to uh, just a linear scaling. How does this work? So let's take a look at this like toy uh, model for a data set in which you want to calculate the middle. So the key concept is that of the complementary similarity. So what is the complementary similarity? The complementary similarity is essentially a similarity of the set in which you calculate the similarity of the set removing one molecule. So this will be the complementary similarity of the green element. And this will correspond to the complementary similarity of the red element right here. <clears throat> so the key insight on this procedure is that when you remove the middle, when you remove the central element, the complementary similarity is going to be at the lowest possible value. Because by removing the central element, that means that the remaining elements are going to be as disjoint as possible. So the similarity of the diversity of that set, if you want, 
is going to get the highest possible value, meaning that what you want is to minimize the complementary similarity to find the midoid of the set. How we can combine these tools? How we can combine this idea of like representing chemical structure, uh, calculating diversity, and finding the most representative structure. So we, in collaboration with uh, Jose Luis and his group, we did a thorough study, like different tools to uh, analyze uh, epigenetic focus libraries. For instance, we analyzed all of these libraries and we were able to quickly identify which are going to be the most diverse. So in this case, the, the TOCRIS, some of the TOCRIS libraries were the more diverse uh, in this study for different uh, independent of the, of the coincidence ratio. So you can see we, we can do like a study of how the chemical diversity is going to change with this uh, hyperparameter of the calculation. And like uh, we see like a perfect coincidence, like a perfect consistency in all cases. We can also see how all these libraries are going to relate to one, to one another and identify, for instance, those are going to be central or the most like the ones that are like a, more related to all of the or, to all of the other ones in this like really simple chemical library representation of the CPNF libraries. And if we apply this middle algorithm to these libraries, we can identify the most important molecules in those sets, which are going to provide really important insights as to the local structure that is the most important scaffolds. So this we complemented, I consider with this, this, this calculations with like a, a scaffold analysis and constellation plots. And essentially now we have a new way of looking at which are going to be the most important structures in these sets as represented here. Another application that we are really happy with with this next maximum guarantee indices is that of clustering, which essentially we use this new uh, indices as a new type of linkage criterion between different sets. So this is like a, the standard hierarchical agglomerative clustering algorithm in which at some point you're going to have, at some like iteration, you're going to have a set, like in the K iteration, you have a number of sets and then you combine the two sets that give you the maximum possible value for the, for the next similarity. We did a really simple application of this in the first work that we, uh, that we published like back in, in 2021 in which we were able to separate, distinguish between two different scaffolds, like molecules coming from two different scaffolds. So as you can see, this corresponds to the uh, missing gradients. We can quickly identify molecules coming from one scaffold, then all the molecules coming from the other scaffold, and finally decide, you know, these two belong to two different groups. And once again, something that we can replicate using more traditional uh, clustering algorithms. Now, as I said before, this is essential applications corresponding to chemical space. I wanted to show you something that goes a bit beyond chemical space, and that is the application to uh, biological, biological ensembles. And I'm going to like go relatively quickly over some of this. This is a, like those, these are ongoing projects with the Perez lab here also in Europe. And the first idea that we apply is like, hey, like if we can identify the most important molecule in a set using this new like middle algorithm, what if we can do the same for uh, different conformations obtained uh, from a molecular dynamic simulation? So as you can see, we can easily correlate this uh, complementary similarity with the mean square deviation from the analytic structure, and we can identify uh, the most important frames on a molecular dynamic simulation of different protein and protein, uh, protein complexes or protein DNA complexes. The key part here is that if you correlate those middle structures to those of the most important uh, frames in the molecular, in the molecular dynamic simulation with the native structure of the protein, you see almost, almost like a perfect agreement. So this could be used to identify, to identify within a molecular dynamic simulation, which are those frames that are most similar to the native conformations of the protein. We didn't stop here because we wanted to have like a more like once again global view of the MD simulation. And then we apply our clustering algorithm. Now comparing the clustering algorithm using the V-measure, <clears throat> once again, over different systems, you see like protein DNA interaction or like a protein uh, G or like a G protein um, simulation. And you can see that according to the V-measure, our clustering algorithm right here, like in the rightmost, provides results that are equally or more robust than all of the other like traditional clustering algorithms using the single average complete or even the more like expensive like word language. Uh, another advantage of our method over this uh, traditional uh, um, linkage uh, proposals 
is that if you use an estimate similarity, you have a way to estimate the number of clusters in your data. So usually when you're doing clustering, you have no idea about actually how many clusters you're going to have. So for instance, in K-main, that K is a hyperparameter hyper that you need to optimize to. But if you use uh, estimate similarity, you can calculate this indicator that is whenever you join two clusters in any given iteration, you can calculate the similarity of the new cluster that you obtain by joining these two and subtract the minimum similarity of the two sets that you're going to join. And then you can plot this quantity with the number uh, of iterations. And you see that you get to one point in which you're going to essentially combine two subsets that should not be combined together, then this quantity is going to really increase. And that indicates that you should have stopped your clustering one iteration before. So using this, we were able to identify the correct number of clusters in these uh, different types of simulations. We can go one step further and we can combine all these tools and apply them to a really complicated problem, such as uh, protein folding, like the analysis of uh, protein folding dynamics, which is something that we did with incredible success. So the idea is that after running a simulation of a protein folding, uh, for, uh, after running a protein, a protein folding simulation, you can take all of those frames and then perform a first uh, classification step in which you're going to calculate the complementary similarity of all the different frames and then divide those, like collect different frames that correspond to given intervals of complementary similarity. So as you can see right here, we have in different colors, different uh, sets of frames that correspond to different values, range of values of complementary similarity. It is pretty clear, according to what we saw before, that those frames that have the lowest possible value for complementary similarity are going to correspond to a native structure, as you can see right here. In blue, all of these structures essentially overlap almost perfectly, and they do correspond to the folder state. On the other hand, those red structures, which correspond to the high values of complementary similarity, do correspond to a random coil state that is like almost no uh, discernible structure or ordering in these conformations. Meanwhile, these intermediate steps, we can now apply our clustering algorithm and essentially being able to identify different uh, conformations contributing to the pre-folded and to the intermediately uh, folded states. So in summary, we can basically take a whole molecular dynamic easily do like a quick semantic based only on this like middle ordering ranking, which is case linearly. So we don't, you don't have to do like clustering in all the data. Then you will only perform clustering in subsets of data, which even though the clustering is also going to scale as n squared, this n is going to be lower than all of the data combined because you're going to have a reduced number of data to apply that, that clustering to. Basically, that gives you a better idea of how your much is going to be structured and that is going to essentially be a more robust way of clustering because you are going to eliminate uh, outliers when you get to the clustering step like summing up with this application because like there is like a relatively little time and the next similarity basically allows you to quantify the similarity between uh, different objects in an unprecedented linearly scaling way uh, these new indices provide a better solution to diversity picking problems. So once again, we not only are allowed to calculate to select molecules faster, but also select more diverse molecules using this methodology. Uh, we can use this index in our chemical diversity matrix and to find a way to represent chemical space, something that we have like we are exploring right now, mostly with the help of like Hosser and his group. We can find really easily the most representative set, a member of a set which we can apply to study either like the genetic libraries or like any type of library or in analysis molecular dynamic simulations. And finally, we can we have developed new hierarchical clustering algorithms, which have proven to be more robust than those uh, that are like currently used in the literature, especially for the analysis of like molecular dynamic simulations. I want to thank uh, my group, like uh, especially team, like the student work this story, like Rogo, Protech, and David, the postdoc also like uh, involved in these uh, ideas. And with that, like, thank you so much once again. Sorry for not being able to, uh, to be there in person. And thank you so much for your time. Have a good day.
Thank you, Dr. Ramon, for your nice talk. I think he's back in the in the Zoom session. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry for, for the problem with the connection. That's really sorry. No, no worries, no worries. Thank you for joining. So if anybody has a question for Professor Ramon, feel free to open your microphone in chat, uh, in Zoom, or type your question in chat. So I have a, a, a quick question, uh, Ramon, especially for like for the students. So you have a, a quite interesting background in, in quantum chemistry, but you are also expanding all the mathematical approaches to similarity. So what's kind of your advice for, for, for the students that are typically interested in one specific area or wants to explore or expand the knowledge to different areas? What's your experience in that regard? Uh, essentially focus on mathematics because if you have like a good grasp on the on mathematics, you will easily be able to, to change from different uh, from different areas. Like much of the of the ideas and tools that I use when I'm doing like a electronic structure, those ideas I can use in chemical informatics because at the end like mathematics is the same. So like focus on mathematics. I know it might not be the the the, the flashes or the most like a, a like well like discipline by many students, but if you have a good grasp on that, then you can easily like change subjects and being able to do different stuff. There is a huge amount of math in machine learning and artificial intelligence, and just like exploit that tool. That's the best advice for everything. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, to, to keep the program in time, I think we need to, to, to move forward with the program, but uh, the audience feel free to type your questions in the chat or type them in uh, Facebook or YouTube. This will be transferred to the chat. And Dr. Ramon, if you can then later please to answer, address those questions, it would be very appreciated. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm now introduced our next speaker. I also on, honored to introduce Professor Jürgen Bajorath. Professor Bajorath received a master and PhD in biochemistry from the Free University of Berlin. He was a postdoctoral fellow with Arne Harlier at BioSim in San Diego, where he began to work on computational methods for drug design. From 1990 to 2004, Jürgen held positions at Brast, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb Pharmaceutical Research Institute, MIRI Research Center, and the University of Washington in Seattle. In 2004, Jürgen was appointed professor and chair of the Department of the Life Sciences Informatics at the University of Bonn. He continues to be an affiliate professor in the Department of Biological Structure at the University of Washington. Jürgen research focuses on the development of computational methods for medicinal chemistry, chemoinformatics, and new concepts for machine learning in drug discovery. Honors include the 2015 Hedeman Skolnik Award, a 2018 National Award for Computers in Chemical and Pharmaceutical Research of the American Chemical Society. Uh, Jürgen, thank you so much for joining the, the colloquium, and we are looking forward to your lecture. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, pleasure to present um, at your meeting. Um, I will discuss a uh, computational methodology today that actually brings together a number of things uh, I've been interested, my group has been interested in over the years. And um, um, the second reason for presenting this, uh, especially also to a partial student audience, uh, I think it's a pretty instructive example for the evolution of a computational approach as we learn more and, uh, and understand more and um, uh, also uh, navigate uh, into uh, the popular uh, artificial intelligence age. So let me talk a little bit about the structure activity relationship matrix and SARM approach and uh, its extension and what it brings together 
Um, first of all, is uh, a systematic search uh, for analog series from uh, compound uh, sources of uh, any type and the structural organization of analog series. So this is something you know, that we have been focusing in increasingly over the years for medicinal chemistry applications. And then a second uh, major interest um, over the years has also been SAR visualization, uh, providing visualization methods for exploring uh, SARs on a local and global scale. And so SARM was originally conceptualized uh, to do just this in combination. And um, a special feature of the approach is actually that it bridges between SAR analysis and compound design. And this is probably its hallmark. And one of the things um, you know, that we have particularly uh, cultivated, let me say that way, over the years. And then the deep SARM extension, which takes center stage here, was designed and implemented to further extend the compound design capacity uh, that is intrinsic to SARM, and then also uh, at compound optimization, iterative compound optimization uh, to the approach, which then essentially covers uh, an entire spectrum of medicinal chemistry relevant um, things beginning from the identification of analog series, the design organization of analog series, the design of new analogs uh, involving SAR visualization, compound design and compound optimization. Uh, so it has become a full spectrum approach uh, if you like to look at it this way. So let me start out uh, providing you with some background information concerning the SARM approach. The identification of analog series is facilitated through systematic compound decomposition, which will I explain in a little bit more detail uh, in the following. And then uh, another medicinal chemistry centric feature of the approach is that it actually organizes structurally related uh, analog series in matrices that essentially look exactly the same as conventional R group tables. Uh, that are used in medicinal chemistry. And that uh, turns out the primary, to be the primary reason why the approach uh, catches on very well with practicing medicinal chemists. Although they might not fully understand the algorithmic basic behind it, but it's chemically intuitive, immediately reminds us of R group tables and can be interpreted as such. Through annotation of these matrices with different layers of information, we can visualize SAR patterns at increasing resolution. And then, as you will see, the uh, approach also delivers as uh, a byproduct, so to speak, fragment-based analog design to suggest additional analogs for series extension. So what is this basic? So um, originally, SARM was conceived as a methodology plus a data structure, as I explained. And for the methodology or algorithmic part, we adapted um, the mesh molecular pair fragmentation, uh, actually the variant introduced by Hassan and Ria, very elegant algorithm. Uh, as you know, MMP analysis uh, became very fashionable in chemoinformatics and uh, computer-aided medicinal chemistry about a decade ago. And so we early on adapted um, the compound fragmentation scheme underlying uh, the Hassan and Ria MMP generation um, to systematically decompose compounds. As you or many of you at least uh, know, an MMP is a match molecular pairs defined as a pair of compounds that only differ at a single side. And uh, we can rationalize um, this organization scheme as an MMP core that is associated with the exchange of a couple of substituents with an MMP terminology is actually called a chemical transformation. And if we do this uh, very systematically, if we fragment compounds systematically, then we get keys representing the core structures and substituents, which are 
term values and with the keys and values, we can build index tables, which actually are extremely efficient to search. And then identify what we have uh, uh, designated matching molecular series as an extension of MMPs, simply defines as a series of compounds that share a common core and differ at a single site. So in medicinal chemistry terms, this would be uh, understood as an analog series with a single substitution site. Uh, the special feature of SARM generation actually is that it doesn't stop there, but that uh, also includes the second MMP fragmentation step. And during the second MMP fragmentation step, we now repeat the procedure not for compounds, but for cores. So for the keys that were obtained during the initial step. And what that then um, uh, brings to the table is the identification of all structurally analogous cores that we can find in large data sets. And in analogy to an MMS, we can also define a core MMS, which then represents a set or series of core structures that are only differentiated, distinguished by chemical modification at a single site. So now we go from the sound generation to the data structure. Each of these core MMPs that we can elegantly and computationally efficiently identify in our index tables is organized in a single SARM, single SLR matrix. As you will see, each row contains a core structure, each column contains analogs of a core sharing the same substituent. Field cells represent existing compounds that can be color coded um, by compound potency, thereby enabling basic SAR visualization already. And then in our core value space, we have typically a lot of unexplored core, core substituent combinations. And in our SAM data structure, reminiscent of our R group tables, these represent virtual analogs that can be immediately considered as compound design suggestions. The organization scheme underlying SARMs implies that data sets of different composition and size, depending on the similarity relationships that are contained in these sets, can produce from few to many SARMs. And these SARMs are independently processed and evaluated and can be independently inspected because each and every of these SARMs as I just said, represents a particular core MMS, so a subset of structure-related analog series that is distinct from all other subsets. This is how the basic data structure looks like. So we have here two, uh, three small model analog series, compounds with potency values. You can see uh, where they are distinguished, these compounds um, at the, the level of the first fragmentation, so the substituents. And then you can see the related core structures. Now, so this would, uh, uh, according to some terminology, now correspond to a core MMS. And then you have a SARM comprising the subset of related core structures and all the substituents that are available. And we have our filled cells, which are known active compounds that we record. And then we have, as of yet, unexplored core substituent key value combinations that represent all virtual analogs. So this uh, very intuitive data structure, easily accessible, even if one doesn't know much about how it was derived, just looks like an R group table, can then use to uh, explore patterns of SCR discontinuity, spot activity cliffs um, in our um, data sets, uh, can be used to uh, navigate regions of SAR continuity where changes to molecular structure only have a um, very weak response in SAR space, you know, small potency alterations, and so on and so forth. So these levels of annotations can uh, be expanded at will and, and they can be made increasingly informative if one would like, but this is already informative data structure 
for basic ex SAR exploration, especially uh, when we extract analog series from very large and heterogeneous compound data sets. Uh, our virtual compounds, um, immediate points of considerations. Uh, it is of course handy to try to apply QSAR or other type of activity prediction methods to these matrices. And this is also something we have um, done in different ways. Now, one of um, the matrix inherent, very intuitive ways to predict a compound potency here for uh, new analogs is by using local free Wilson QSAR models, so mini QSAR models that only depend on the immediate neighborhood of a virtual analogs and actually in a number of um, applications, including some prospective compound design applications, despite their simplicity, these matrix-based local free Wilson QSAR models are uh, particularly relevant and uh, accurate uh, as they are essentially based on only the immediate neighborhood of a given compound. In addition, of course, we can uh, derive machine learning models for matrices of increasing size or for um, arrays of matrices where we want to systematically predict uh, virtual analogs. Uh, so that's a whole way, uh, you know, whole spectrum of things we can do to prioritize compounds for further analysis. Uh, as I just said, one of the hallmarks of the data structure is that it typically contains uh, from uh, multiple to many SARMs now that uh, for data sets of very large size with many different analog series might be difficult, it might become difficult to navigate um, as a whole. And therefore, uh, another sort of extension that we considered over the years was to add to these, uh, if you like, decentralized data structure of uh, sets of related analog series distinct from others, add to this a complementarity global molecular view. And that gave rise ultimately to the development of uh, what we call molecular grid maps, which summarize SARM content for entire data sets and sort of provide bird's eye view of the SARs that are contained in these data sets. So what we do here is uh, carry out simple similarity calculations for existing and virtual compounds. Uh, so we generate a similarity matrix suggested to dimensionality reduction, and then use a placement algorithm uh, we have chosen the uh, Janka Volgenand uh, algorithm here for um, linear, uh, to address the linear assignment problem, which is sort of a computationally more efficient way uh, compared to the original so called Hungarian algorithm that has been used for linear, linear uh, programming assignments. But this works very well as a placement um, algorithm. And uh, by applying this, we can summarize as indicated here, um, the compound and information content of different SARMs and generate molecular grid maps of increasing size. And we can augment this display for actual compounds, existing compounds with potency predictions again for virtual compounds. These would be now at the global level obtained by machine learning um, only rather than local QCR models. And then we can get bird's eye views of relative sizable uh, data sets. A uh, couple of thousand compounds or so is not a problem at all. So we can see here for set um, of kinase inhibitors, now about 1700 kinase inhibitors um, that actually, uh, when we summarize the information provided from SARMs, um, generate about 14,000 virtual analogs to choose from. And then our global molecular grid map view enables to focus in on uh, uh, different areas uh, where we uh, might see SAR discontinuity uh, being prevalent um, or areas um, where we might have 
sort of to extended areas of SAR continuity with individual hotspots of potent compounds. We can zoom in on those and uh, inspect the neighborhoods and then uh, also select candidate compounds that um, virtual analogs that are predicted uh, to be attractive, predicted to be potent. And so the global view through the molecular grid maps is a nice complement of local um, SAR views provided by individual uh, SAR matrices. So uh, this essentially um, has been the story behind SARM and how it has evolved over the first period of um, this particular project. There are other functions that uh, we liked and found interesting that we implemented along the way to further complement the SAM approach, which I will not be able to present today, but this is essentially all published stuff uh, if you're interested in, in this and, and search for uh, the SAR matrix, you will find these things uh, without any problems. However, another major step forward then after uh, we became sufficiently familiar with SARM, its opportunities, as an identification structural organization, but also predictive tool uh, for us was to further, further expand the compound design capacity of SARMS. So if you think about the intrinsic um, information content of SARMS, we can perceive the large populations of virtual analogs that are produced by SARMs as something like a chemical space envelope that narrowly surrounds and encompasses related analog series. It, narrow, it is narrowly confined around these analog series because while the core substituent combinations are novel, the underlying core structure or R group fragments must inevitably uh, originate from the data set. So it must be present. So this is okay for close and analog design and practical applications in, for example, uh, compound hit to lead exploration optimization. But it's conceivable and can be attempted, of course, to further extend the design capacity and um, the structural novelty of compounds that we can create beyond of fragments originating from the original data set. And so specifically, we can emphasize three different opportunities here. First of all, what we would like to do is further increase chemical space coverage uh, one of the things that cannot be done based on the compound underlying compound fragmentation scheme, of course, is introducing core structure modifications. Now, this is also something that is of considerable interest for lead optimization, as you undoubtedly know, uh, but cannot be facilitated based on the approach underlying SARS. So this is another important uh, and interesting step forward that one could entertain. And thirdly, as I also explained, since the underlying compound decomposition framework is principally focused on analog series with single substitution sites, one would also, of course, like to have the opportunity, especially in practical applications during later stages of compound optimizations, to introduce additional substitution sites in advanced compounds. Now, this can all be facilitated if we make use of novel developments um, that are provided by um, generative compound design. And so, Deep Sarm originally was introduced as our quote unquote AI. Uh, or better to say, deep learning extension of the SARM concept through the addition of generative 
fragment-based analog design. So it's a special kind of generative design that we entertain here that clearly follows a particular fragment and a compound hierarchy, as I will also explain as we go along. So um, deep sarm uh, is um, can be understood as one of the chemical language models that have been borrowed um, essentially feel from the field of language, natural language processing. One of the areas, as you know, where uh, deep learning uh, made its mark uh, over the past decade with specific advances. And these uh, models have entered uh, the chemoinformatics scene because of their ability uh, to effectively uh, process uh, textual representations uh, or um, beloved smile strings, for example, uh, and um, being adapted for generative compound design. And so these models typically involve pre-training on compounds that cover a larger chemical space. So for example, as a design application, if you want to stay with the example uh, that I just presented, we can pre-train these models on uh, inhibitors covering kinome space or uh, a specific kinase family. If you want to be the approach um, a little bit more focused from the get-go and then followed by fine tuning where we can focus in on a specific region of chemical space. For example, um, a region that uh, contains an analog series of interest and so fine tuning would be done with known active compounds, um, act, uh, known active compounds of our primary target of interest, any given target of interest. And so the primary application, if you go back, uh, think back to the uh, different um, uh, goals for extending the design approach, would simply be to expand original SARMs with combinations of novel keys and value fragments that do not originate from our original compound sources. So this would be fully consistent with the basics and principles of the SARM approach. And what this would do for us, what this would facilitate would be an expansion of original SARMs with novel compounds. So this is a graphical illustration of the underlying approach. So a SARM approach would always start from known active compounds um, do the significant, the systematic compound decomposition, generate the index tables, organize the compounds and analog series, and then have our virtual analogs to choose from. And the deep sum approach now would add to this a chemical language model approach to navigate chemical space um, for related targets followed by fine tuning on our primary target of interest. And when this all comes together at the end of the day, we would have original SARMs originating from our conventional approach, which then would be design objective one, further expanded through novel compounds. And in order to do this, uh, we need to recall again our um, canonical hierarchy for fragment-based design that we follow here. So our core structure, when you think about the dual compound fragmentation scheme, our key one in SARM, uh, following SARM methodology, we would be composed of the key two and value two fragment originating from the second fragmentation step. So any core structure of an active compound can be get generated by adding a key two and a value two. And if we add value one to this combination, then we have generated a new compound. Following this hierarchy, we need three generators, three generative models for computing new key two, value two, and value one fragments respectively. And the deep sum architecture that we implemented for this purpose is doing exactly this. It is composed of three different encoder decoder models uh, containing uh, LSTM, long short-term memory units. And these models in chemoinformatics have become pretty popular as you might know, or are even becoming more popular these days as sequence to sequence models is one 
derivative or one form of a chemical language model. There are many others. Uh, what this architecture essentially represents is a recurrent neural network designed for the transformation of smile strength. Put smiles in, you get transformed, smiles out. No? So this is the analogy to natural language process. And the keys and values, uh, let me emphasize this one more time, for our analysis still originate from our dual fragmentation, fragmentation scheme underlying SARM generation. And if we apply deep SARM this way, then we can expand our compound design space to novel fragments and obtain compounds, core substituent combinations that still fit into the SARM classification scheme, but do not necessarily belong or originate from the original chemical space. So during the pre-training, we adjust our models to our greater chemical space. Uh, we have our three sequence to sequence models or generators here to reproduce, to generate our new key two value two and value one fragments respectively. And the key two generators take other key two fragments as input as the initial step. Then new key twos are used as input for the value two generator. In the value two generator, and after the value two the generator step then, we still need to compute value one according to the hierarchical organization scheme I just introduced to you. And we do this on the basis of T2 values. And during pre-training for our generators, we get our initial weights that we then transfer, our neural network weights that we transfer to the fine tuning step. And then during fine tuning, during focusing on a smaller set of specifically active compounds for our target of interest, we then adjust the weights for this design task. So this is an example uh, shown here for the generation process one more time to illustrate it in chemical terms. Uh, this uh, diagram here is applicable to a pre-training step uh, where we use uh, essentially all compounds from kinase safari, a bit more than 40,000 molecules to pre-train the models. And then as a design application, fine-tuned the model on uh, Aurora A kinase inhibitors. And here you can see again uh, the underlying hierarchy as it is then covered, fragment hierarchy for a fragment-based design approach as it is then covered by the three different generators comprising the SARM architecture until we ultimately obtain a novel compound. So any given SARM that we have in our data set, when we go through this process, we typically expand it with compounds, with novel compounds, novel analog series that originate from our deep SARM design effort. And this is illustrated for one individual SARM here. Now, where we have the subset, smaller subset of series and compounds that originate from our original data set. And then within the SARM, we have here in the magenta um, and the region marked uh, in magenta, here framed in magenta, we have then all the compounds that originate from our additional uh, deep SARM design effort, and you can see how nicely it, com it complements existing series, but then also adds novel series to an existing SAR. And in fact, uh, as a part of this uh, design effort, expanded design effort, we might also uh, create novel SARMs that even uh, do not contain any original data set fragments. This can happen as well, um, depending on the compound series that we investigate. And so now we have much larger analog space available to guide um, the selection of analogs for series expansion and also introduce some more uh, chemical novelty in uh, the design exercise. So now uh, the second and third variant uh, or extension, objective for extension, of the compound design capacity introduction 
of um, core structure modifications in analog series, but also a further extension uh, to analogs with multiple substitution sites can be facilitated by modifying uh, the generator models, the sequence to sequence models uh, of the SARM architecture, or even adding a new one. The second design objective, introduction of core structure modification can nicely be combined with another objective that we consider it would be very, very nice to have um, as an addition to the SARM slash deep SARM approach, and this would be compound optimization. So you discover in the course of your analysis compounds um, that become focal points for further optimization efforts and then you would like to have the ability to optimize, further optimize these compounds already in the SARM context and specifically select novel analogs for primary compounds of interest by going through optimization, iterative optimization cycles as a part of the deep SARM analysis. So this integrates compound optimization and the introduction of core structure modification in a way I will illustrate to you now. So these iterative optimization exercises that we entertain on the basis of SARMs can either be guided by the log likelihood scores resulting from our sequence to sequence models and or by potency prediction methods. Potency prediction is a little bit more intuitive, especially for visual um, uh, interpretation of the results when uh, we have only little time to look at them. And therefore, if, uh, for the following illustration, I selected such a potency um, optimization example coming actually from a real optimization project. And so in order to facilitate the combination of core structure modifications and iterative compound optimization, analog optimization for SARM components of interest, the iterative deep SARM extension or I deep SARM extension, how we call it, must have two components. Component number one would be centered on our value two and value one generator, because if we build in iterative feedback loops, by generating compounds, predicting their properties, in this case, potency prediction, feeding them through the evaluation approach, updating our training database with compounds predicted to be increasingly potent and then go through a number of iterative um, cycles here at the level of the value two and value one generator, then we facilitate optimization for compounds of interest. For the core structure modification, another component is required. And this component must be centered on our key two generator. Because if we want to have core structure modification, then we need to introduce these at the original part of the design process where we deal with the most rudimentary core structure. And this would be, according to our formalism, the key two fragment resulting from the second optimization step. So in order to introduce core structure modifications, we tune the key two generator in order to uh, optimize new, uh, in order to produce new key twos with core structure modifications. And this can be done by feeding additional data to the um, key two um, generator from our expanded design approach. And it can be further augmented through smiles-based data augmentation, now, which as some of you might know is also a popular approach um, to extend the capacity of sequence to sequence models if we only have limited training compounds available. And so the modified K2 generator in iDeepSARM combines these two different ways. Uh, uh, involving compounds from the quote-unquote outer design space <clears throat> and then also smiles based uh, data augmentation to come up with core structure modifications. So let's look at a practical example here. <clears throat> excuse me. 
from a design project. So here the, uh, the purpose has been to design a dual inhibitor of um, a kinase and of bromo domain uh, containing protein 4, which is um, a high level cancer target these days. And uh, from available inhibitors, a key two fragment was chosen after some generation. And we can look at the SARM uh, that combines the value two and value one fragments in a pairwise manner. So it's sort of a SARM variant that are required to generate actual compound from our key two. And so key two plus value two is the core structure of a compound plus value one, the substituent, then produces a novel compound. And so you can see here, uh, this is information content from the original uh, SARM slash deep SARM modeling, uh, where we have existing and virtual fragments. And so there's a combination here of um, experimental potency and uh, predicted potency values. And you can see this is pretty scattered here, um, pretty diverse compounds have either known or predicted uh, potency values at very different levels. And now we feed this into our iDeep SARM component one and we do our value one and two optimization uh, for this uh, key two, for the scaffold of interest. And then you can see over the course of time iterative cycles that we enrich uh, the SARM variants here, uh, the iDeep SARM variants uh, for matrix display, increasingly with compounds predicted to be potent from which new analogs can be selected. And now we can add to this the ability uh, to generate core structure modifications. So now we combine this approach with component two from iDeep SARM we generate new key two variants with modifications as indicated here in red. And then we can recombine those with our um, deep SARM fragments that were generated to this point to see what the ensuing potency distributions might be and study their differences. This is shown here. Now here we have different key two variants from our BRD4 kinase inhibitor, dual inhibitor design, design exercise. And you can see here uh, how nicely small magnitude uh, core modifications are actually introduced by the modified uh, uh, key two sequence to sequence model. This is very interesting from the point of view of chemical diversity, sometimes only changing the uh, topology of the molecule, but then also introducing chemical changes and even introducing new heteroatoms in um, ring core structures. And so this is clearly a capacity that we can only obtain through generative modeling. Now this would have been impossible before with scaffold-based methods or retrosynthetic approaches or other decomposition methods that we have employed. And then we can go through the recombination exercise here with those fragments that we have generated up to this point in the deep SARM analysis. And we can look for fragments that would be particularly suitable to complement existing cores, pushing compounds in the direction of high potency, predicted potency that is. And then we can select those and go back to component number one of our iDeep SARM approach and re-optimize the value one and value two fragments. And this is then uh, a rather uh, information rich uh, way to further expand our analog design space and push compound optimization to the next level. So let me summarize the major points that I've been making here. So uh, again, illustrating a little bit this evolutionary aspect that I alluded to at the beginning uh, from the inception of a new methodological concept, in this case, about 10 years ago, um, to what we look at today. So the SARM methodology was originally really conceived to combine structural organization, identification and structural organization 
uh, of analog series extracted from compound data sets and complement this with SCR visualization and basic analog design. And this was what ZARM supposed, was supposed to do and what it actually did and does very nicely. Uh, it was complemented then with different functions um, to further enable intuitive access and uh, analyze structure activity relationships at increasing resolution, only one of which I've been able to show today, the molecular grid map, which complements the local views of SARs and with the bird's eye global SAR view. Then DeepSAR uh, was really conceived to extend the compound design capacity, compound design space of SARM and introduce chemical novelty into the design process. And this was only possible uh, for us making use of recent developments in generative modeling, adaptation, and further development of, chem of uh, um, chemical language models. And then more recently, uh, we added the iDeepSAM variant to the mix, which then through the I'm tempted to say rational modification and extension of the sequence to sequence models adds iterative compound optimization and core structure modification to the approach. And uh, currently uh, new generators are um, designed to further extend compound suggestions to analogs with multiple substitution sites, which can actually, uh, is actually pretty straightforward using the component type architecture that we have. Uh, it is less challenging chemically than, uh, for example, the introduction of the chemically meaningful modifications of core structures that are introduced. So in both published and unpublished applications, SARM, deep SARM, uh, the SARM deep SARM approach has actually produced a number of novel active compounds, not all, all of which can be reported. Uh, I collected here some key publications that mark little milestones uh, along the way of the methodological uh, development, beginning, beginning from the original, original inception uh, to the most recent um, deep SARM variant that was implemented. And then there are also uh, key, key publications reporting novel active compounds. Um, first, uh, SARM applications uh, also date back a number of years uh, where novel compounds have been identified with the basic version, if you like, and then more recently through the deep SARM extension. Let me close with some uh, uh, acknowledgements here. There have many people uh, over the past decade contributed to the development of this approach. I must limit myself here to four key players uh, who have uh, pushed uh, many methodological developments uh, early on, Anamai and Disha, and uh, uh, especially Atsushi, who has done most of the work on uh, the deep sarm extension presented today. Then I also want to uh, acknowledge major experimental collaborator, uh, Hiroyuki, Nakamura, who actually is synthesizing a number of the compound suggestions on different projects in collaborations coming out of the lab. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention and again, the opportunity to present to you. And uh, if I can, I'll be happy to entertain questions. Well, thank you so much, Jürgen, for your, for your lecture. And we do have uh, several questions on the chat. Let me start uh, uh, reading one. Uh, this one is from uh, Dr. Freddy Bernal. It's an excellent talk, uh, Professor Bayorat. I have two questions. Have you considered compound synthesizability within deep SARM? I need to find the question first. Let me just see. Is it? Okay. Now we're getting there. Yeah, okay. So let's see, what was the first one? So if you consider compound synthetizability with deep, deep SARM. Uh, yeah, uh, but not as, 
Well, actually, there's a story behind it. We have not implemented or added currently a uh, uh, particular um, assessment function to predict and quantify this, but this has historical reasons. Um, and this dates back to the original SAM approach and now also to the synthesis of compounds coming from deep SAM because it turns out um, that we had an about 80% uh, success rate in, in designing original, um, in synthesizing original SARM virtual analogs. Uh, this is probably attributed uh, to the data set centric selection of core structures and R groups. But surprisingly, uh, this hasn't dropped uh, for deep SAM and uh, for practical applications we typically select on the order of 10 or so analogs and uh, then at least 50%, half of those five, six or so are synthesizable and this is all we need. Uh, so this, this is why we don't make any, any synthetic accessibility prediction, but it's easily possible. You just have to use this as another scoring function. For example, guiding the design, uh, you can combine synthetic accessibility score uh, with compound potency predictions or log likelihood scores or whatever you like to do. So this is not a major issue, can be done, uh, but we currently don't rely on that. Okay, thank you. Second question, if uh, is, is the code uh, for SARM freely available? And, uh, a part of this has been, made, has been made available, few routines, I forgot exactly what it was over the years, uh, but the most recent version is not made available. Okay, all right. Thanks. Uh, another question. This is from Ana Luisa. Well, I actually, actually, let me back up. Sure. Um, there is uh, the actual code is to make this clear. It's not made available because of some IP constraints. But on the basis of the information provided, it's all published. Uh, on the basis of the information provided, the entire approach can be regenerated in a pretty straightforward manner. It's all based on public domain tools. And, and I'm personally aware of uh, a couple of pharmaceutical companies who with some help and guidance have completely implemented their own versions from scratch and, and use this also completely independent from us. So it's all published works based on all public domain tools. So for the ones really interested, uh, you can you can easily re-implement the entire approach. No magic about it. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, one question from Ana Luisa Chavez. Can be deep SARM architecture use molecular representations like SMART or deep smiles? Yeah, can be easily adjusted. I mean, that's uh, very straightforward to do. Uh, you can easily replace standard smiles uh, with other textual representations, which is actually one of the uh, you know, major advantages of the chemical language models. And so they can be, we have recently uh, developed another tool in the lab where we completely go away from smiles and we actually use again, uh, fragment representations, uh, which are encoded in a completely different way. And it's very straightforward. Okay. Thank you very much. So we thank you again for your uh, pleasure. Thank you again. Thank you so much for joining. And now I'm gonna have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Oscar Mendez Lucio. Dr. Oscar Mendez Lucio got his PhD in chemistry in cheminformatics from the University of Cambridge in 2016. He has uh, experience applying artificial intelligence approaches in large pharmaceutical companies, such as Bayer and Janssen. Recently, he joined Recursion Pharmaceuticals, a senior machine learning scientist, where he applies deep learning to help chemists design molecules with improved potency and safety profiles. Oscar has published more than 40 scientific papers, including some featured in Nature and Nature Communications. Oscar, thank you so much for, for joining the, the colloquium. The thank you, for Seth, thank, Thanks for the invitation. I'm really, really happy to be here, as always. I mean, I'm a, an alumni from UNAM, and it's always uh, great to be back, even if it's virtual this time. So today, can you see my screen now? 
Yes, yes, we can see yeah. your full screen. Perfect. So today I'll talk a little bit about this project, which we started some years ago, which is called Geometric uh, Deep Learning for Structure-Based Drug Design. But um, actually, even I'm currently a recursion, this work was done at, at my time in Janssen Pharmaceuticals. So just want this to be clear. I will start with a little, very short introduction of my uh, pathway, career pathway, because that I know this can be a bit of curiosity and then go directly to the point of, of the talk. So yeah, as Jose already mentioned before, I'm a graduate from UNAM, then did my PhD in informatics, and then uh, did some uh, work at pharma companies. Now I'm um, at Recursion Pharmaceuticals, and here what we do in the company is trying to decode biology and to industrialize drug discovery. So basically we use uh, phenotypic screens and combine that with AI approaches in order to have faster, uh, a faster pipeline. Um, so that's why we, we call, or we say we want to industrialize drug discovery. And I'm showing this because uh, many people ask me, why you, if you are doing more computer science stuff as a chemist, did, did I did a mistake? And the question is no. I think this is a great uh, way to get into computer science. Um, and right now, I think everyone needs to be, what we say, bilingual. So speak the language of two different, uh, let's say, sciences in order to be able to communicate across different fields. In my case, it's chemistry and computer science. OK, saying this, um, I want to jump directly to what's the current state of structure-based drug design with AI, with deep learning. And with this, I just want to mention why is this that difficult? So first of all, one of the difficulties is the representation. How can we represent proteins and ligands in a way that computer and AI models can really um, get all the information in there and do predictions? Of course, a simple way to do it, it's just taking amino acid sequences um, and smiles, which are really easy to to work with with, with uh, natural language, language processing models. But however, the information code in there might not be ideal for structure-based drug design. Why? Because we don't have 3D information um, encoded in, that, in those representations. Second approach could be to use grids, uh, which, like the ones that have been used with convolutional neural networks or voxels. Uh, this is a good way to capture 3D information of ligands and compounds. Actually, this has been used uh, in current docking approaches like auto, auto dock uses a grid to calculate potential. Um, also, it was used in different uh, 3D QSR approaches before, like CONFA or COMSIA, which calculate like a grid of, of descriptors. And of course, it's natural now to use it with uh, convolutional, convolutional neural networks. However, these approaches, like the one you see here, uh, have two problems. One is, um, it's very sensitive of how you calculate the grid, if you rotate it or not. So for that, you will need to do augmentations of data. So that means you will need to rotate your molecule a lot of times in order to calculate many snapshots of how it behaves in the grid and use that for, for learning. And the other drawback of, of using grids, it's um, the amount of computational resources that it needs. Why? Because you need to calculate one grid, uh, sorry, like a, um, man, many properties for each small square or cube in this big grid. And these many properties will be even uh, bigger as depending on your embedding size. And the bad thing of this is that many of those cubes will be empty. So it will be not really informative because it will be empty space. Uh, this scales very fast, very quickly, and just fills your memory, GPU memory, RAM memory, uh, very fast. So you cannot really work with large uh, complexes. The other option is to use uh, uh, atom level information, as we can use it with uh, graphs, with convolutional uh, graph neural networks. And this has been done before. So there are like a point net, which uses uh, graph level or, or atom level graphs in order to predict binding affinity. 
this is good. Um, I think this is uh, how the field is moving. However, of course, you have thousands, thousands of, of atoms in one protein, uh, ligand protein complex, which sometimes can be make it uh, really difficult for for computational capacity to handle this kind of information. Now, the second difficulty of using or, or that we face during structure-based application of AI, it's uh, that we need to make our models uh, that work with different rotations and translations of our uh, input data. This means our results need to be invariant to rotation and translation. If you give an input uh, an input complex or molecule, and then you rotate it, you expect the energy that you calculate, the distance that you calculate, or whatever property that you calculate will be the same, even if you rotate that uh, 150 degrees or, or you move it around in the space, right? So the interaction won't change. So we need to have the results to be invariant to, to that. However, we need to be our features or the way we represent each atom to be equivariant. So that means it needs to do small changes as we do small changes in the, in the rotation or the translation. So it, they need to vary in an equivalent proportion to the rotation that we are doing. So this is really difficult. And now the third difficulty that we can see, which is not really anymore, it's uh, we need really good data sets with high quality of data and a lot of data. So right now, our the, the data sets that we use usually, uh, it's either PDB bind, which is a cleaner version of PDB and has around 20,000 complexes, which are supposed to be cleaned and ready to, to use for AI or just go directly to PDB bank and then you need to do all the pre-processing to, to use this data. And still it's not, it's, it's far to be comparable to the data sets that are used for images or for language, but still it's a good start. So now in order to, to just avoid or to turn around these difficulties, the way we, we plan to do our project was we started think, thinking as a medicinal chemist. So how does medicinal chemists think? So they look at the structure, how the, it binds to the protein side, and then they start asking, hmm, I see these interactions. Okay, this interaction looks good. Sometimes, look, sometimes they look like not really good, a bit odd. So how they will check if one interaction is real or not. What they do usually, they just go to data. So they take the interaction, they are not really sure if it's real or not. Let's take this interaction as an, as an example. Um, and they want to know if these two atoms are, it's common for them to be at 2.5 Armstrongs of distance. So they go to the PDB bank, they analyze all proteins that they have the, this interaction between uh, this amino acid and, and this kind of uh, substructure. And for example, they construct this kind of, of plots. So they have this frequency, how many times they see this interaction and the distance at, uh, they can observe these interactions. So you see in this case, uh, most of the time that they see this amino acid with this other structure, you can find it around 2.5 Armstrongs. However, you can also find this interaction around four Armstrongs. So it's not white or black. So you can have uh, two different distances between this fragment and this amino acid. Uh, the same for other interactions. So, but in this case, it can vary. For example, here you find that 2.5 Armstrongs, which once you see the, the distribution plot, yeah, it's possible to find it at 2.5 Armstrongs. However, it's more probable, more likely to find these two fragments separated at four Armstrongs. So we wanted to take this intuition of how people analyze this kind of data and translate it into a deep learning model. Uh, one thing that we couldn't 
two is to have a database where you have all possible fragments measured with all possible binding sites because that's unfeasible. It's too large uh, data. You can create it or curate it from PDB, but it will take you years of postdocs uh, positions. So, however, we, you, you can learn these interactions using DeepDoc, which is the, the name of the model that I want to, to show you today. You can learn the distance of or how likely it is to find um, one fragment separated from one point in your binding site and use that to score a complete uh, ligand. So let's start of how we can represent proteins and ligands. So for proteins, instead of using grids, uh, sorry, yeah, grids, as I mentioned before, we don't, we don't want to use it. Instead of using atom level graphs, we use a graph created on this protein surface. For this, we use um, an approach that is called massive, that uh, was uh, reported in 2020 by a group at, at Switzerland, I think. Basically what they did, they create a protein, a mesh on the protein surface, and at every node of the mesh, they calculate different or four properties. They calculate the electrostatics, the hydropathy, uh, the hydrogen bond donor and acceptors, and the shape index. So these will be uh, our descriptors on each point of this mesh. And we have 3D, I mean, this is a 3D sh uh, shape, uh, the surface of a 3D conformation. So what we have, work, we have coordinates. And we use those coordinates to assign features for each uh, edge between two nodes. So between two nodes, we will calculate the difference or the distance between these two nodes and use it as a, as a feature for that specific edge. Uh, I want to make clear that for this, this is a 3D input. So we need the, the 3D uh, information of the binding site. However, for the ligand, what we use as an input is the 2D representation of a ligand. So a ligand, a molecule, you can represent it as a 2D graph in which each atom will be a nose and each edge will be a, oh, oh, each bond will be represented by one edge. In this case, we featureize each node by a one code encoding of the, the atom type at that specific node, for example, here, all the blanks will be zeros, and where you see color will be ones. Nose one, it's an oxygen. Uh, nose two, it's a, a phosphorus, etc. And the same for the nodes. We can featureize the, uh, the bond type. So if it's single, double, triple, aromatic, uh, etc. Uh, for this example, that is the one that I will use for the rest of the talk. Just want to make sure, or just want to mention, mention that the 3D mesh that we are using here, it's 350 nodes and we have nine atoms in the ligand. Now, let's start with the ligand. How can we get or extract learned information from the ligand structure only using information from each node? So for this, we use graph neural networks. Uh, let's take, for example, node four, which is a carbon. It's just here. And let's see how convolution works on this uh, ligand network, uh, on this ligand, sorry. So at the beginning, we will have the information of node four, as I mentioned, will be just a one code encoding telling us this is a carbon. Okay, this is the input data. Then we do the first convolution. Uh, graph convolution, basically what it's doing is takes information of the neighbors and aggregate it to the central atom. So if we are center at atom four, it will take information of atom three, atom five, and aggregate it at the information of, of uh, node four. So after the first convolution, we will have uh, the vector representing node four will have information, not only of one atom, but the central atom and the one N environment. So atom three and atom five. If we do a second convolution, okay, now this gets more interesting because now you get information of the two K uh, neighbors. So that means, that means uh, in atoms separated by two bonds. This case will go one step further. And of course, uh, the information after the, 
the information in that vector will contain a bigger fragment. If we do a third convolution, then you aggregate information that goes beyond. The way I like to think of this graph convolution, I say it's like gossips. So you start with one point with one person and it just takes information from the neighbor. Um, in, the next, uh, in the next convolution, it takes the information from the neighbor and the next neighbor and so on. As, and as it happens with gossips and gossiping, the further you go, the information it's it's even bad and bad every time. So it just gets worse. Um, however, that's why it's not that a good idea to do 20, 30 convolutions because every time you aggregate more information and it's not uh, as of high, high quality as if you do a small, a small, a small number of convolutions. Anyway, for this graph convolution, okay, the, the process I mentioned before, it happens for all atoms at the same time. So in convolution one, each node will learn their neighbors, the first uh, degree neighbors. In second convolution, the fragment goes uh, one bond beyond, and the third convolution, it goes one bond beyond. So maybe this idea of looking at radiuses, neighbors, etc., it's familiar for you if you are into chem informatics, because this is the same way uh, ECFPs, Morgan fing fingerprints works. So they look at neighbors, uh, they aggregate, each time a bigger radius, a bigger uh, information of the neighbors. Um, it's a similar idea. However, instead of having pre-factorize uh, these uh, fingerprints, we are learning this information, uh, uh, learning a function that will give you that information. Okay, we just, I show you how graph neural networks work in atoms, in ligands, but the same idea is in the mesh. So, one convolution will start with one point in the mesh. After doing the, the, the next convolution, it will grow the information and start, instead of having information of one point, it will have the information of one patch in the protein surface. Okay, now let's go to the interesting part, the network architecture. So we have as input, independent inputs, one for the ligand, one for the target. As I mentioned before, for the ligand, we have information of nodes and uh, edges. And for the target, we have the features of uh, calculated with Massive, which was uh, hydrogen bond donors, electrophilicity, hydropath. Uh, I don't remember anymore, but the four uh, features we mentioned before. And as edge features, we have the difference in each axis. So the distance in each axis. We put this as an input into two different graph neural networks with residual blocks. And after this uh, feature extraction uh, step, we have new features. So in this case, the nodes will have information of all the neighbors and the same in the protein nodes or the protein point will have information of the a path in the protein surface. Now, how can we uh, combine information of ligands and proteins? Well, we just did a pairwise concatenation of each ligand in the node with each, uh, so, sorry, each node in the ligand with each node in the target. So you just concatenate the, the vectors and this will be the features of that, of the interaction of a specific point or patch in the protein with specific uh, atom in the ligand. If, I, if you remember before, I mentioned we have like 350, uh, nodes in the target and nine ligands. So if we do the maths, we will have 350 multiplied by nine number of uh, vectors here or combination. Um, now that we combine this information, now the, the question that we need to ask is what we do next? Should we use this information to predict a binary interaction just saying, Okay, they are close, or they inter uh, this atom interact with this part of the protein or not. We can binarize distance and, and predict, okay, this atom interact or is usually close to this point in the, in the protein. Uh, the distance is usually less than one Armstrong, less than, than five Armstrongs or not. We can actually um, uh, predict 
uh, coordinates for each points. For example, this is something that can be done, which I don't recommend because our architecture is not a key variant. Uh, I can explain this in the questions, but um, won't be that easy to, to predict this. Or we can predict distance. So what's the distance between one point in the protein and one atom in the ligand? Uh, we went for the last one. We wanted to predict distances. Why? Because as you remember in the, in the first example, the way medicinal chemists thinks about this is, okay, this distance, the distance between this fragment and this part of the ligand, is it common or not? However, it's not that easy to predict distance. And the reason is that as I, in the example that we have here, you see that um, this specific uh, ligand atom and this specific uh, pro uh, part of the protein can have, <coughs> are usually at 2.5 Armstrongs, but also can be at four. So you, you not only have one answer, you can have two answer or more. And in this case, RMC or this kind of losses, L1 loss or something like that uh, is not ideal because it will learn uh, probably the mean values, the weight and mean of all these uh, distances, which is not what we we'll want to have. We want to have this kind of distribution. And if there are two possibilities, we want to have the two possibilities in there. The way we went around this is we learned the parameters of a mixture of ga Gaussians. A mixture of Gaussians is basically, you can combine different Gaussians in a way that you can predict the, the probability of the new function. Uh, to do that, you need to, of course, first know how many Gaussians you want to use. In this case, in this example, you have a three uh, mixture of, of three Gaussians. We use 10. You need to have the mean of every Gaussian, the standard deviation of every Gaussian, and something that is called a mixture coefficient, which tells you a weight or a coefficient for every Gaussian in the final mixture. The nice thing of using a mixture of Gaussian is because then you can very easily sample and calculate the probability at every point here. So that's why we, instead of predicting distances or coordinates, we predict the uh, parameter parametrizations of, so these three values means standard deviation and mixture coefficient of um, a mixture of Gaussian that resemble this uh, distance distribution. Uh, that means if we have uh, this case where, where you have two possible uh, distances, you can actually represent that in a mixture of Gaussians. And then actually you can calculate the probability at each point. So we did that and the final architecture looks like this. So you have your input, you have your feature extraction with a graph neural network. You combine the features from ligand and targets. And then for each combination, you predict a mixture of Gaussian. So you predict these three parameters. We have an auxiliary loss here. Uh, which just helps to, to train. But the idea is that for each combination of ligand and, and target nodes, you will have let's say, a distribution like, that looks like this. Important here, the inputs that we use are 3D protein binding sites, where we have the coordinates and the shape, the surface. We have a 2D graph of the compounds, so no 3D information in there. The output will have probability distribution, which will tell you if one point of the protein, uh, how likely it is to be a specific distance from one atom in your ligand, which will look something like this. And for training, it's the only part where we use uh, 3D or information, 3D information from the ligands, because we calculate the real distance between uh, the ligand and the protein in a 3D complex but it's not used for prediction. So if you want to predict the score of a um, 2D ligand, you can perfectly do it with this approach. Now, how we jump from density or distance densities to a scoring function. Okay, if you want to score a 3D ligand, which was not used in, in the training set as an input. So basically you take um, your 3D conformation you predict using the 2D 
uh, graph of these ligands and the 3D shape of the protein, you calculate your different um, distance distribution for every combination of nodes and protein uh, nodes and, and ligand atoms, for example, again, we start with 350 protein nodes, nine atoms. This gives you uh, around 3,000 pairwise interaction, which means we have around 3,000 uh, distance distribution like this. So in this example, I just use three, but you can have 3,000 uh, for this specific example. For every of these 3,000 uh, interactions, you measure the distance like we do here. And using this distance, you go to that specific distance this distribution and you evaluate it and you get a likelihood. So you can see what's the likelihood of having that atom separated for that protein uh, point. You just sum across the 3000 uh, distance distributions and that will be your score as you have it here. Okay, we wanted to use this distant likelihood. So wanted to really see if it works or not. And for that, we use the CAS 2016 benchmark. So it has 258 different complexes. It's divided in four tasks, scoring and ranking, which is more um, if you reproduce ligand, experimental ligand uh, binding. So IC50 or something like that, like this equivalent. And you have docking and screening, which really tells you how well they are used to to score a complex. The docking task uh, for each of these complexes, you have 100 decoys. Um, the idea is to score all these decoys. And it's a good uh, scoring function if the real decoy, it's, on, it's uh, the best score or anything uh, that is not more than two, two Armstrongs in RMSD, it's scored as as total. And you have the screening task, which is about finding the right uh, binder. So you have the forward screening task. So you just start with the, the ligand, you score 28,500 uh, conformation of different compounds, and you need to choose, or the best score should be the right ligand and the reverse one. So you have one ligand, and then you score the different proteins against that one. And of course, you need to, to find the right one. Uh, these are the results com compared to other uh, scoring functions that have been trained or used in this CAFS uh, 2016. In docking power, we do very similar to other um, widely used scoring functions. I was surprised, uh, for example, that glide score is a little bit uh, below, but Basically, they are really, really similar, all of them. Uh, however, in forward screening, it was really good compared to the others and also for reverse screening power. So we were really happy to see these this results here. Uh, but that's not all. Actually, since you can score conformations, that means you can optimize a conformation based this scoring function and as it's done in docking. So um, we took uh, the rotatable bonds of, of a compound. Uh, we use the translation and the Euler angles. So it's, we took, for example, uh, these values started like randomly. Uh, we score all these conformations. We use a, an optimization method, in this case, uh, differential evolution that will help us to optimize these functions in order to find the most likely conformation of the bound ligand to the protein, to a specific protein. And this process is iteratively repeated until we, we get an energy minimum or uh, the most likely conformation. Uh, this is shown in the same video. So here we start with, a, with the ligand in a random uh, conformation and random position. And you will see here, how these three pairs of ligand uh, and protein points are optimized. You will see the whole score that is calculated here and how it starts moving around, trying to find the best fitting. And then finally it gets stabilized and just finds the, the final conformation. 
So this is how it works. Let me see if I can stop it somewhere. Okay, uh, as you will see now, uh, almost at the end, it finds the right distances where you have the highest probability. It, it not need to be the highest all the time. For example, in this example that you see here, it's the overall high. And so we wanted to see how well it works, this scoring function uh, with differential evolution in the CAS 2016 uh, data set. So with the 285 compounds, we saw that it successfully optimized to, to 225 out of 285 compounds. So successfully is that it found some, uh, an energy minima with a mean RMSD of 1.8. 87 Armstrongs, which I will say it's, it's not bad. Uh, something that we realized is those compounds that didn't finish the optimization is because they had like many rotatable bonds. So it has more, they have more than 10 rotatable bonds making the optimization very difficult. And that's why the optimization uh, algorithm didn't find the, the minimum with the parameters that we were using. Of course, if you tune it, it's possible to find the minimum. The same exercise was repeated with a test set, which was left out of training as well, a bit larger, like around 1,367 uh, compounds. And we observed very similar results. So those with lots of rotatable bonds were not uh, optimized, fully optimized. Um, however, the RMSD of compounds that with successful optimization was 1.62 Armstrongs, which is quite decent. So with this is just wanted to, to show you an example of how we can use geometric deep learning uh, to learn distance distribution and that we can use for auto optimize uh, or to learn a potential for ligand target interactions. This, this potential performs similar or better than very well-established scoring functions. Um, I wanted to, to mention that we don't want this to be the end of this research area. Of course, uh, now new models are starting going into this direction of, of, of 3D drug uh, structure-based drug design, and not only on predicting binding activity, but really um, making the computational tools that we have faster. And if you want to know more about this or the details, I can please check the preprint that we have uh, came out archive, or you have also the published paper here. I want to thank my co-authors, Masin Ahmad uh, and George, uh, George Berkner from Janssen and Antonio Del Rio from Imperial College London. So all of them, great team. And I'm happy to take questions. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Oscar, for the very nice and excellent lecture. Uh, now we have time for questions. Again, if anybody in Zoom wants to open the microphone or type the question in chat or type the question in, in YouTube or, or Facebook, and we can read it to to Dr. Oscar. So I, I, I have I have a question. So um, how do you uh, envision uh, this approach to tackle uh, where actually to, to, to the, Dr. Tudor Press says the dark targets, those kind of uh, unexplored targets. What's your perspective on this regard? I think it will be possible because actually what you are, I mean, if you know, if you have like a 3D confirmation, uh, I think it will be of, of the target. I think it will be completely possible because you learn small bits of the protein surface. It doesn't need to be, um, so each point gives you small, small part of, of the surface that then you can, a combine, match and combine, uh, as you wish, creating the surface of a um, yeah, unknown target or a new target. Okay. 
Okay, all right, thank you. So now we have a question uh, from YouTube. This is from Angel Santiago. It says, a great talk, Dr. Oscar. My question is, what are the main limitations using geometric deep learning for scoring functions? This is in comparison only uh, with only knowledge scoring functions. What are the advantages? With other deep learning functions? Uh... So um, what are the main limitations of using geometric deep learning uh, scoring functions instead of as compared to knowledge based? Okay. Yeah, there are different advantages. Uh, for example, is that since it's not based on known or yeah, pre-parameterized uh, force fields, for example, um, you learn how it, you have more flexibility to learn this uh, distribution or these potentials um, automatically. So once you train it, you automatically extract this. So it's it's easier and faster to parameterize compared to knowledge-based scoring function. Two, probably if you have, for example, knowledge-based scoring functions are only parameterized for small molecules or a specific set of small molecules. But imagine you work for with organometallics or something similar, and you have some information of how this can bind, you can easily aggregate this information in a fine tuning of the model or natural products, for example. So it's easy to, to apply to or to expand to other parts of the chemical space. And yeah, at the moment, probably the part of the optimization is not really optimized. It, it's a bit small because we didn't spend a lot of time making this faster, but it can be as fast as any docking uh, program that we use. Okay. Now, a, a question in the chat from Jordi Mestres. How dense is your surface mesh? Do you really need all points in the protein surface mesh? And the question is, for inference, inference or prediction, probably not. For learning, uh, we use a, a threshold of 10 Armstrongs from any uh, 10 Armstrongs from, from the ligand. We just use those points. The question here is, we, do we use all these points uh, or are they informative? And the reason I would say is that they help us to define I'm oh, sorry. They help us to define a part of the, or, or the tail of the distribution. So for example, here, the, the points that are farther from the ligand will help us to define this, this tail. Most likely will be, go, it's going to zero. You can exchange that with a function that you can predefine. Uh, but if you want to take the, the real or exper experimental value, yeah, it's a good, good idea to take those points. But yeah, it could be other strategies to to get only the, or use only the those points. Okay, all right. Now, uh, a follow-up question of Jordi Mestres. Have you performed an analysis of the decay or improvement in performance as you reduce the number of mesh points? Yes, as we reduce it, yes. Um, if I remember, we used 10, 7 Armstrong, 5, and 3. The, the distance between 3, 5 was not really, I mean, um, the performance was not as good. And the one from 7 and 10 Armstrongs was very similar. So I will say from 7 Armstrongs uh, apart should be, should be OK. okay. No, another question from uh, Euridice Juarez. A very interesting presentation. What criteria does the graphical convolutions function take into account for the construction of the ligand vector? Um, sorry, Jose, can you repeat the question, sure. please? Uh, what criteria does the graphical convolutions function take into account for the construction of the ligand vector? Okay, so yeah, that's a good question because at this, 
basically you just so the criteria is to start with specific node uh, features so features for each atom and for each edge this Features can be as simple as this atom type. You can add other kind of features, for example, charge or multiplicity or any other feature aromaticity information here. And the same for the edge. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the structure, we didn't use any extra criteria. We just use message passing uh, graph convolution neural networks here. And something that is important is we did not aggregate the node information. So we keep the node information independent, independently. We never aggregate, because you can aggregate this information of each node into one vector for all the molecule, summing these vectors, for example, but this we didn't do. Okay. I hope I, I, asked the, I answered the question correctly. Yeah. All right, thank you. So one more question from YouTube, uh, from Rafael. Have you considered using multiple enzyme conformations instead of a fixed one? Um, yes and no, that, that's a good question as well, because since we want to, it's possible to, to use a mix ensemble of conformation, yes, uh, specifically for those cases where the crystallographic uh, <coughs> Output gives you different conformation. This is common in some very flexible uh, compounds or binding sites with lots of space. Uh, we just took one because the, the cleaning of the data was much easier and the treating of the data was much easier. But yeah, you can take these ensembles of conformation. However, uh, I had really advise to use only experimental information here to train your, your model. You can do it with uh, information coming from docking or from MD. There is no limitation there. However, the, the density that you will learn will be very biased by the force field or the methodology that you use to create those conformations. Okay, good. Thank you. So now there is a, a message from Abel Suarez. It says, excellent lecture, Dr. Oscar, a very interesting work. Greetings from Morelia, Mexico. Thanks, Abel. Uh, one more question. This is more kind of a career development question. Sure. As a deep learning researcher, where can I work on this? Uh, I think it's completely open. By the way, this is a good question because we have open positions at recursion. So if, if you want to apply, just go to our web page. Uh, we have one open position for chemical informatics and deep learning. Um, now, as a career, I think as a deep learner, it depends more what you like. Now, I'm sure any big pharma or startups are using machine learning at every stage, or at least at the research stage, for sure, and I'm sure in many other parts of, of the pipeline. Apart from that, um, now, if you are more open and not really focus on, on pharma, you can always go to video analysis. Um, I don't know. Now, now there are many, many things going on. I've seen even people that use deep learning to analyze football, football matches. So this is also something uh, is completely open. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Now, one more last question before we move to our next speaker to keep in time. This, this is from YouTube. What are the advantages of the model you present against other models, such as diffusion models or autoregressive models? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, to be honest, I think they are a bit different. This is more, I would say, like a probabilistic model in a way because you learn the probability distribution. Uh, diffusion model, as far as I know, is more like a generative model. Uh, which allows you to create new things. For example, you can create a new conformation uh, or new protein or something like this, new compounds as, as it was shown in, in previous lecture with generative models. And with autoregressive models, I think it's also for analysis. I, 
I, probably it's it's possible to use autoregressive models also for structure based drug design. I still uh, I cannot have an idea right now how to use it, but probably there is application of that. Is just thinking of first defining the problem that you want to to solve, and then try to find the best tool to solve it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oscar. So again, uh, we really appreciate your, your presentation. Uh, thanks for joining the colloquium. Y muchas gracias por, por unirte, Oscar. Gracias. 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 No, thanks, for, thanks to you and all your team that are doing like a great, great job uh, putting this together. This line of speakers is just amazing. I'm really proud to be just next to Jurgen or Tudor. It's, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. So no, we're gonna move to our next speaker. It's the last but not least talk of the session and the colloquium. I'm honored also to present uh, Dr. Tudor Oprea. Dr. Oprea is a, is a digital uh, drug hunter with decades, three decades of experience in machine learning, acknowledge management and applied to target and drug discovery. He holds an MD, PhD from the University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Tomiswara, Romania. At AstraZeneca, he developed the lead-like approach and came GPS. At the University of New Mexico, he helped evaluate 505 bioassays spanning hundreds of thousands of chemicals. This led to the, to the identification of seven NIH designed chemical props, including the first agonist and antagonist for GPER and later inhibitors for GLUT2, GLUT3, and GLUT5 transporters. Tudor has been developing machine learning models since 1989, first in cheminformatics and QSAR, and later in disease and target biology. His team developed Drug Central and Pharos, part of an NIH uh, Common Fund project. He has co-authored over uh, 270 publications, 10 US patents, and edited two books on informatics and drug discovery. He currently works at Royband Discovery. Tudor, thank you so much for accepting the, the invitation. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Can you all see and hear me? <clears throat> yes. I apologize if I sound a bit... Uh... Uh, rough. I'm recovering from a just recent illness. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully uh, this will all work. And uh, in case there is a problem, just let me know and uh, I will circle back. Uh, we can also, see I took... <clears throat> you can see my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Also, I took the liberty after watching Catching Up with the Conference on YouTube and uh, uh, briefly consulting with uh, Jose, uh, I decided to sort of extend. Uh, so this might be a bit longer talk. And uh, since it is uh, afternoon in uh, Ciudad de Mexico, uh, I am hoping that that is acceptable. I know it's uh, Friday evening in Europe. For those of you watching from Europe, uh, uh, I think you can take a glass of wine and hopefully you'll enjoy this. So uh, Oscar sort of paved the way. He started to talk about his trajectory. So uh, I figured I'll, I'll talk about my trajectory as well, but uh, I start with a bit of a scientific uh, conundrum. Uh, we humans can't even agree on the simple question of which year it is. And uh, that sort of starts defining the problem of the very definition of knowledge, uh, the definition of truth, uh, these are problems that still bother philosophers uh, and scientists today. It's just that we tend to not worry about such minor details like what is truth or uh, what is knowledge. But uh, to keep in mind, uh, uh, in order to progress in informatics in general, uh, we need a set of conventions. So the only way we can say it's 2022 is because we all agree uh, that's the year. But in China, it's 4720 and uh, it's uh, 5782 in Israel. And if you were to have listened to the Mayans, uh, it was predicted that the world would end in uh, December 21, 2012. So those of you who remember 
uh, before 10 years ago, there were lots of books on every book stand uh, about the end of the world. And uh, I guess the Mayans may have made a slight prediction error and luckily we survive. Uh, so it's all about conventions, right? And uh, the problem with conventions is that we have to be aware of them. So uh, I'm just using geography as a clear example of convention, but uh, in principle, this applies generally across informatics and data science and uh, as well as machine learning. So what do we know? When do we know it? These are not uh, trivial questions to answer. So I'll share a little bit of a uh, example, uh, not so much anymore because now they have 3D maps, but um, in the... Uh, early 2000s when there were large screens on airplanes and I would uh, cross the Atlantic uh, between uh, Albuquerque and uh, Gothenburg, uh, it would frequently show a map like this and the route of the plane would cross Greenland and uh, eventually pass the UK and uh, I would end up in, in Sweden. And uh, if you see this map and most of you are familiar with this uh, somewhat dated representation, it shows Greenland as a really uh, large surface and Africa in the center as a small uh, continent. Uh, the reality is that we tend to use conventions all the time. Sometimes we're not even aware of them. This is a surface corrected uh, geographic representation. Uh, puny uh, Greenland is at the bottom and that's the surface correction of that. And then of course, Africa is enormous in surface and uh, we should just be aware of our uh, biases. And the other bias of course, is that uh, in the old days, the explorers by definition put Europe on top because they were Europeans and they had set to conquer the world. Uh, Australians came up with a different view which says, well, Australia is on top of the world too. It's just a matter of perspective. So um, need to be aware of our biases. The other problem is there is no strict definition of truth. We don't really know uh, what we know when we know it. We're, we use computers that treat everything in binary uh, and uh, it's not really equipped to handle contradictions. And uh, thank you, Jerry Majora for coming up with the whole uh, discussion about fuzzy logic. Uh, sometimes things are neither Lipinski compliant nor non-compliance. And sometimes things are not true or not true. Sometimes they can be both. And so uh, we need to also start thinking about machine learning into beyond the binary classification and use uh, maybe the four kinds of truth uh, that for instance, uh, the philosopher Nagarjuna talked about, which is true, not true, neither true nor false, both true and false. So there's like four different types of truth and uh, the only problem, the other problem is that uh, we live in a world of relative truth. So if you talk about uh, uh, soccer or football World Cup champion, that changes every four years. So uh, truth of that attribute uh, changes and Stanley Cup, of course, uh, changes uh, frequently, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we even watch uh, weather as an entertainment because we don't really know what the weather is going to be like anyway. Um, and... Uh, I also like to quote uh, really smart uh, people, just like Jerry, he likes to quote Einstein. I like to quote uh, Master Yoda, uh, only a Sith deals in absolutes. So we need to start dealing with relative truths. And uh, we also have to consider that we live in a murky world where facts have an expiration date. And if that sort of uh, doesn't bother you think that uh, even in physics, uh, Newton ruled the world until about 115 years ago, and then Einstein came along. But in biology, this happens a lot more frequently. Uh, in 1948, uh, there were two adrenergic receptors described. Now with all the uh, molecular biology, we know there are nine adrenergic receptors. Does that mean, does that invalidate uh, Alquist's paper from 1948? It does not, but it does put it in a different perspective. So we have to think about uh, facts and expiration date. So going to my trajectory, this is sort of my uh, education and, and my mentors. Uh, I owe a lot to Francis Snyder from Timisoara. Uh, he was a professor in physiology and uh, he helped me pass the admission exam which was mandatory in Romania. That was a very difficult hurdle. 
and was my mentor and PhD advisor. And uh, once the Berlin Wall fell and I was able to travel westward, uh, my first stop was in Utrecht, where I had a chance to work with uh, professors Bert Jensen and Andy Winter. Andy Winter went on to start uh, Cresset uh, and the extended electron distribution model. Uh, I was one of the first students to use that. And while working with Andy, he kept saying, you got to go to St. Louis, work with Garland. So I ended up working with uh, Garland Marshall. Uh, as I joined Garland's group, uh, every single postdoc was recruited straight to industry. So I had a plan to go to the industry. And then the head of uh, Merck was quoted on a cover of a magazine saying that drug discovery will be done by computer before long. And then all of a sudden, nobody was hiring uh, computational chemists. So I was more or less forced to take a second postdoc. So I ended up with uh, Angel Garcia at uh, Los Alamos, and that's how I ended up in, uh, in New Mexico. So uh, I learned small molecule modeling from Andy and Garland, and then uh, a lot about uh, protein modeling from uh, Angel. And Angel, of course, is Puerto Ricanio, and um, from him I learned about Santana and all those other things like salsa and uh, all the good things that uh, we appreciate with the Latin culture. Uh, back in Romania, uh, I owed a lot to Mircea Mracek and Zeno Simon. In fact, Zeno Simon was uh, the first person to introduce me to the idea of QSAR uh, back in the 1980s. And then uh, Jack Omdal mentored me once I joined uh, UNM. But before that, I had the chance to work with a true drug hunter, Bank Doblad, in Yoteboy. So when I was at AstraZeneca, uh, Banked uh, was uh, responsible for the first uh, beta blocker with the intrinsic uh, uh, sympathomimetic activity. It's called metoprolol. Uh, he also co-invented uh, felodipine, the first uh, calcium channel antagonist, and also the first serotonin reuptake inhibitor uh, back in the day. So he was a, a true drug hunter. Of course, not all of this was without problems. Uh, so for example, the reason I had such a hard time passing the exam of admission to medicine, I wanted to be a chemist, but uh, turns out uh, I was uh, partially colorblind. So uh, according to a uh, Romanian legal system, I was not allowed to study chemistry computers or get a driver's license. And uh, luckily I moved into a country where that's not the case. I also uh, fell in love with uh, emergency medicine and I was working as a volunteer nurse. Uh, our dictator Ceausescu decided uh, we're not going to spend money on uh, or hard currency on anything. He wanted to pay Romania's foreign national debt. And in February 87, within the space of one week, uh, all of the drugs that were imported disappeared from pharmacies in Romania. And uh, that meant that I witnessed firsthand uh, uh, people dying because we didn't have uh, 100 mg of hydrocortisone acetate to give them when they were in uh, anaphylactic shock. So this was a completely idiotic system. It changed my view of medicine completely. And I decided I'll never be a practicing physician. So I finished my MD, but I decided I was going to be a scientist. Um, part of the culture shock after being in the Netherlands, which is a super lovely country. Uh, I moved to St. Louis and uh, the first thing was I bought was a bicycle. I was soon discovered that you cannot bicycle anywhere in St. Louis. That's probably still true today, uh, unless you go to parks. Uh, and then back in the day, there was no Starbucks. So uh, coffee was bad, uh, beer was bad. Luckily now there's microbreweries. So lifestyle has changed a lot. Of course it has improved, but uh, man oh man, 30 years ago, it was a very different story. And uh, I also had the first case of a uh, stolen work. So uh, I did some uh, extensive docking on a protein and somebody took my work and uh, there was a science paper where my name is misspelled in the acknowledgements. And uh, I basically did all the computation, but uh, it's an x-ray paper. And so uh, none, none of my work got credit. Uh, at Los Alamos, uh, I was a physician uh, amongst the physicists and that had its own problems. So I sort of had to deal with uh, the problems of uh, not being strong in Boltzmann statistics or being able to follow every single 
uh, uh, potentials of reinforced conversation and uh, I was sort of a misfit. So uh, I ended up uh, leaving Los Alamos, but not New Mexico. And uh, so I migrated to Sweden where I stayed for six years. And uh, <clears throat> the first day I was at work, I ran into Bank Toblad. And the first thing he said to me was, have you discovered any drugs today? And that sort of resonated with me because uh, even today, I still consider uh, every day when I get up, I'm like, okay, so how can I do this? Uh, how can we do better? So uh, hopefully I'll, I'll touch upon that uh, later. Uh, I also try to give you a spatial trajectory. So uh, I sort of hovered somewhere from, uh, of course, Romania. Then I, I went to Netherlands then back to Romania. Then I migrated to St. Louis. Uh, Albuquerque or Santa Fe, uh, and then I ended up in Gothenburg, then back to New Mexico. Uh, I spent a stint in uh, Perugia with Gabriele Cruciani, and then uh, also in uh, with Søren Brunak in, in Copenhagen. And uh, as of February this year, uh, I work for uh, Roy Van Discovery in uh, Boston. And uh, because the pandemic has changed our migration patterns, uh, I'm allowed to do that while working from New Mexico, which is super cool. I also thought I'd give you a very different view of the same uh, data. Uh, so rather than showing a spatial pattern, this is a temporal pattern, uh, covers about 40 years. So uh, from the late 70s, I, I was in Romania. Uh, I spent some time in the Netherlands and then sometimes in the US, uh, sometime in uh, Sweden, the US, a little bit of Italy, Sweden, Denmark, uh, and then uh, mostly Sweden and uh, Denmark and the US in the last uh, decade or so. In fact, uh, until recently, I had uh, dual uh, visiting appointments with the University of Copenhagen and the University of Gothenburg. Uh, one uh, slide I stole from Hugo Kubini, uh, who was one of the fathers of uh, QSAR and 3D QSAR. Uh, it's somewhat dated, but it illustrates the purpose rather well. Uh, and this is the kind of things you could publish in Nature uh, 40 years ago. Uh, basically, you can warn people about the dangers of uh, confusing correlation with causation. And uh, people talk about it a lot. Uh, people remind each other, pay attention. Uh, things aren't always what they seem. However, uh, we often think that if something is in conformity with our initial hypothesis, it must be true. And we sometimes forget that it might simply be a question of mistaken interpretation. Uh, I recommend that you read uh, A Biologist Describing a Radio. It's a paper that uh, was first published in Cancer Cell. I think it's easy to find online, Yuri Lasepnik. Uh, Basically, he tells us about uh, the problem. The, one of the major flaws of biological research is the absence of a proper quantitative language. I am aware that systems biology is trying to correct that, but it's not uh, an, an easily uh, fixable problem. And uh, part of that uh, paper illustrates the adage that the more facts we learn, the less we understand. This uh, I also try to address in a Nature Drug Discovery uh, 2018 paper uh, somewhere in um, at the end. Uh, Feigenbaum was one of the first architects of artificial intelligence. Uh, he warned people that when you know very little about the topic, you shouldn't expect knowledge to explode quickly. That's why we frequently witness uh, uh, exponential explosions. It's because in the first few years, it sort of trails off at the very low levels. And we also tend to rely on confirmation bias. So uh, uh, Nicolas Nassim Taleb has written books about this, uh, Fooled by Randomness and uh, The Black Swan, uh, among others. And uh, he uh, talks a lot about uh, the dangers of confirmation bias. And we also have the tendency to just fit alternative facts, uh, tilting the balance of truth, uh, which we think we are doing the right thing, but we're probably not. And also John Ioannidis, uh, who is a professor at Stanford, uh, famously claimed that 75% uh, 
percent of biomedical publications are false. So you can uh, trail that that line of thinking as well. It's it's quite an interesting uh, part. So what I want to instill in you is that data is not information, it's not knowledge. And uh, I just built a very simple example. Uh, assume you have the phone number and address of every living person. It just doesn't tell you anything about them. There's lots of data. Uh, once you attach to that uh, a complete genomic profile, you might begin to think you have information, but it actually, you have to attach some sort of psychological profile to actually get to knowledge. So those are different bins. They're different types of categories, different values. All of them present information, but it's a different slice of information. It comes in different ways. And we have to think, what are we looking for? What do we need to make a decision? What do we need to for our research to move forward? So the really important part where uh, machine learning comes in, and that's why I, I titled my talk, Learning from Machine Learning, uh, it's to articulate the data into knowledge. So we come up with machine learning, we take the data, we build something, which means we act on what we have to try to push the project forward. And uh, that action in itself is actually the learning component. And it's not just a matter of fitting the data, it's fitting the data, interpreting it, and learning what it tells us, and then trying to reformulate or formulate or confirm or falsify a hypothesis. So again, keep in mind that truth evolves over time. And then keep in mind that the building blocks, data, information, knowledge do not necessarily lead to wisdom. Uh, just because somebody progresses in years doesn't make them, make them wise. And the same uh, applies to uh, the process of uh, application in, in sciences. So just because somebody has worked on a project for 20 years doesn't necessarily make them wise. It just makes them being in the project for 20 years. So from our perspective, we try to find the novel therapeutic uses for proteins. And of course, we try to find novel therapeutic uses for chemicals. And the, both of these are uh, time and resource consuming. And uh, we have to keep in mind, this is still a, a complex process. So we'll talk a little bit about the science and uh, uh, I promised earlier that I can show you that I can dance. And uh, the have you discovered any drugs today? Uh, the, one of the most clear cut uh, results that started from scratch begins with uh, uh, G1, which is uh, the 2D depiction is here. And then a 3D superimposition of G1 uh, over estradiol is, is shown here. So this was uh, published in Nature Chemical Biology where we pretty much uh, started with a uh, in vitro assay uh, that complemented the virtual screening assay and we identified uh, G1 uh, and it turned out that G1 was a selective uh, agonist for uh, a novel receptor at the time called uh, GPR30. We followed this up, we, we got the NIH grant. So, of course, we had to publish this to get the NIH grant because uh, initial submissions of the grant, basically the study section said, yeah, you're using virtual screening. We don't think virtual screening will amount to anything. So uh, no funding. So once we published this and everything was cleared, then they gave us money and we used that money and we were able to describe uh, the effects of this receptor in vivo uh, using both an agonist and an antagonist, which uh, we disclose in this paper. So uh, just the, the temporal uh, story of uh, how, how much and how difficult it is to, to get these discoveries. So uh, the project started in 2002. Uh, I joined UNM in 2002. By 2003, um, I was able to push uh, uh, their high throughput flow cytometry from 10 compounds a day to 1200 compounds a day. So basically pushed uh, the Prescott library on them, which uh, at the time had 1,200 compounds. Uh, Jeff Orderburn was able to build uh, a Alexa 563 conjugated probe with estradiol, which was used for the uh, flow cytometry. We took about a year discussing with ChemDiv to uh, build a custom-made library that was enriched in GPCR ligands as well as pharmacophore uh, for the screening. So that was a 10,000 compound library. And uh, we uh, 
selected 100 compounds for screening because even though uh, the throughput had moved to 1200 compounds a day, there just wasn't enough uh, Alexa probe uh, or the, the conjugated uh, material. So uh, they were able to screen maybe uh, 100 compounds in the space of six weeks. So it, it was a very slow process. On the plus side of it, uh, that's when AB1, AB1 was disclosed a lot later in 2019, but uh, G1, uh, we focused on that one first. So this was identified through virtual and flow cytometric screening. Uh, what we did first with that, because I had worked with AstraZeneca before and had been in charge of uh, compound collection and had seen a lot of high throughput screening, uh, I got independent synthesis to confirm retest. So once we were sure that we had the right chemistry and the right biology, uh, we were able to file a provisional patent. And uh, at the same time, Eric Prosnitz and colleagues uh, published uh, a science paper which showed that GPR-30 is an intracellular GPCR. So even the whole dogma that GPCRs are membrane receptors, yes, it is a membrane receptor, but it's on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. So we described G1, uh, we described G15, the first antagonist. Uh, we tinkered with G15 because it had some residual ER alpha activity and we removed that completely. So this is a better agent, G36. Uh, and then uh, Todd Ripke from uh, UPenn uh, basically came out with a story where he used uh, the three ligands which were available uh, from Tokpris, uh, among other chemical vendors, uh, to, to show that GPR signaling, it's now renamed the uh, G-protein coupled estrogen receptor, uh, has a very uh, significant role in melanin formation. He started a company, licensed, uh, renamed uh, G1 to Linnaeus 8801, it is orally bioavailable, it is not toxic, it has been uh, given in uh, people since 2019 without any side effects. And as of 2021, uh, there is an orphan drug designation uh, for metastatic uveal melanoma for uh, the Linnaeus uh, compound. And then of course, uh, just to remind you, it does take uh, a long time and the village to create from, from a virtual screen. So we did the virtual screen in 2004, we published in 2006, uh, and uh, it literally took uh, 15 to 20 years, as everybody says, to, to get to orphan drug designation. The other story uh, starts very differently. Uh, we looked at Ketorolac. Uh, the reason we selected Ketorolac was a high throughput screen at the University of New Mexico from uh, Angela Wandinger Ness. And what Angela did was to develop a high throughput uh, flow cytometric assay. It was a 10 plex, uh, 10 small GTPases being evaluated at the same time, really cool technology. Uh, they found uh, R naproxen as an initial hit. This was part of the Presswick library. Uh, at the time, I don't know now, but at the time, Ketorolac was not part of their library. And so I looked at naproxen and I immediately suggested uh, nabumetone, uh, which with its uh, active uh, metabolite 6-MNA uh, for testing, it turns out 6-MNA was completely inactive, which uh, then led me to formulate the hypothesis that since 6-MNA is inactive, then maybe that methyl group here plays a crucial role. So then I looked at uh, NSAIDs that were not in the Presswick library since, since we knew those were not active and uh, I uh, chose Ketorolac uh, for, for it. And uh, so with the Ketorolac story, uh, the Ketorolac story sort of started in 2007 and then uh, it took a lot of funding from NIH to even progress to an open label clinical trial. So it's, it's literally, uh, a place like University of New Mexico simply does not have the financial prowess to carry uh, full-fledged clinical trials on, on drugs. Even when you know you're sitting on a potential gold mine, it, it's really difficult to, to prove. And uh, I'll just point out, so uh, Linda Cook, uh, this R01 that was awarded in 2020. So we started the work in 2008, nine. So by 2009, we had identified Ketorolac as the potential uh, hit. And uh, we published this in 2011. So 
in, in that period, uh, Linda had gone through uh, three hospitals in the Albuquerque area, collected medical records for uh, patients that were given ketorolac for pain management. Uh, typically in this country, they give you opioids before surgery, but some people just have a strict contraindication so they don't get uh, uh, morphine or derivatives. So they got ketorolac for pain management. And it turns out that those patients that got ketorolac prior to ovarian cancer surgery had a much better chance of survival than the ones that took opioids. So that was a very clear story. And it took nine years for NIH to believe her. And it took that nine years because she used money that were coming from uh, different sources. And she eventually teamed up with the team in Canada uh, that did a much bigger study and confirmed her findings. And it's just a matter of uh, NIH said, we don't believe you. We believe you cooked the data. And uh, the data is there, it's just no one believed it. So this was now licensed to Revere Pharmaceuticals as well as Advanced Biology Concepts. Uh, and uh, it's possible that it will end up in the clinic as a potential uh, treatment for metastatic ovarian cancer. So what did I learn from this uh, uh, two decades of uh, experience with the uh, University of New Mexico is that it really does take uh, 15 years for basic science to, to turn into first time in man experiments. And a lot of people are so excited about drug repurposing, especially with COVID, uh, and I'll, I'll touch on COVID a little bit. But uh, the reality is it's not a lot easier with COVID either, because what you still have to do is even if you have an approved drug, uh, you have to have access to deep pockets. And I don't mean deep pockets as in the computational deep pockets, but the ones that actually carry lots of funding. And you have to get lots of funding to be able to do the clinical uh, trial. So there, there's no uh, free lunch, basically, even with drug repurposing. I'll switch gears a little bit from applied uh, science and uh, actual discovery to, to the realms of targets and machine learning in targets. And then I'll go back to QSAR in, and machine learning for small molecules uh, uh, because I, I learned a few things in the last few months, things that I knew but then forgot. So there are sort of three pillars of drug discovery diseases, targets, and drugs. So I'll try to touch on all of them. And in each of these areas, you can do a lot of work uh, that would benefit from the use of machine learning, AI, data science, informatics. They, they, they sort of blend together and it's difficult to separate them, but wherever possible, we try to use them. So uh, for example, one of the papers that received a lot of attention is a list of uh, all the human uh, drug targets, uh, mode of action drug targets, uh, and this was uh, published in, in 2017. Uh, it took us seven years at the University of New Mexico to build this list independently. John Overington and his team at EBI uh, did the same. We compared results and we, we published together. We're in the process of uh, uh, writing a follow-up of this uh, five years later. Uh, in fact, we're meeting in July to, to work on the paper. And uh, the, the story is that uh, it, it, it's very difficult to ascertain how drugs work. And uh, we say this in the manuscript, uh, we assume that this is how drugs work, but we don't really know for sure. And uh, the only way to ascertain for certain is to have, for example, an animal model where you say, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 melatonin induces sleep via the melatonin receptors. You give melatonin, the animal falls asleep. Then you do CRISPR-Cas, you remove the melatonin receptors, you give melatonin and there's no effect. And that's the only way to show that the drug target is indeed the drug target and nobody's willing to do these experiments. And there was a very scary paper published in Science Translational Medicine in 2019, where they looked at uh, some of the top 30 leading uh, oncology uh, targets. They CRISPR cast the targets out, the drug still worked. So uh, they're just killing cells. They're not necessarily working uh, according to the way people are saying. Uh, 
The other thing that happened at the same time as we were working on this paper was that NIH had a call on uh, uh, identifying drug tar uh, dark targets. So this was an initiative called Illuminating the Drug Will Genome. And uh, because we had already had a lot of advances in understanding how uh, drugs work, so we knew where not to look, we were able to come up with a definition on what dark targets might be looking like and what are the criteria to identify dark targets. And I'll mention that in a second, but this led to a very complex initiative. It's still ongoing, has another two, uh, one year and a half uh, of funding. And uh, there are three uh, large groups that do experiments on G protein coupled receptors. These are uh, Brian Roth and Brian Chiquette, uh, Lily Jan and Mike McManus lead the ion channel group, and then Gary Johnson, uh, leads the kinases group. There's an outreach component, a data science component, and several tools components. This is somewhat dated because uh, some of these uh, uh, grants have uh, ended recently, but there will be a new uh, CIT award uh, soon. So what we were able to propose in this uh, 2018 paper, and uh, this was the crux of the proposal that got funded for the IDG KMC in uh, 2013, uh, we proposed a four label category, so a, what's called a knowledge-based classification for human proteins. So we basically said that we think the human protein has four uh, categories. Uh, at three o'clock are the approved drug targets, what we now call the CLIN. Uh, there's those for which we have a pretty decent tackle on their chemistry, we call these TCAM. Uh, the dark targets are the ones where uh, there's very little annotation as to their function, so there's not enough publications. Uh, we use a technique developed by Lars Jul Jensen in Denmark uh, called fractional publication count. We also counted antibodies as well as uh, gene reference into function. And everything that wasn't the dark t clean or t chem ends up as T-bio. So T-bio, we know the biology, but we do not have a, a chemical probe or, or an approved drug to modulate them. And uh, of course, there is a temporal evolution attached to this. So the first uh, categorization of T-DARC uh, initially out of uh, 20,000 uh, human proteins, uh, uh, about 40% uh, were dark. And over time, that number has decreased dramatically. So uh, from 9,200 uh, to less than 6,000 in eight years, uh, uh, that's significant, that's progress, scientific progress, it's amazing. Uh, not so much dramatic progress when it comes to TICLIN. Uh, we sort of uh, had to revise the criteria over time. So there's a little bit of drop here, but that's just because partly uh, Uniprot, we, we base everything on proteins curated in Uniprot. So sometimes Uniprot will uh, take a protein name and split it into three protein names, or sometimes it will retire a protein name uh, completely because it turns out uh, uh, so th they have this void category and sometimes or what we did uh, more and more is to be more careful with the curation so uh, some of the more liberal curation back in 2013 for the nature drug discovery paper we we revised them more uh, so we lost a few but the short of it is there's not a dramatic increase in TCLIN. And if you want to read about the 2021 approved uh, new drug targets introduced to the market, there's a one page paper in uh, the May issue of uh, Nature Drug Discovery. So part of the effort with uh, IDG KMC was uh, to focus on maintenance and development of these two resources, uh, Pharos and uh, Drug Central. Uh, I encourage you to visit faros.nih.gov. Uh, you can easily create an account. Uh, it's easy to navigate and search by disease. You can do disease similarity. Uh, it takes disease information across 11 different channels. It includes DisGenet, uh, it includes CTD, uh, Lars Jensen's. There, there's a lot of resources that are being captured and interrogated when it comes up with answers. And uh, I'll come back to, to Drug Central a, a bit later. So let's talk a little bit about diseases. <clears throat> we rely on a technique that's been uh, developed by uh, Lars. 
where we look at uh, this uh, fractional paper count. And why is the fractional paper count relevant? Uh, say you're interested in the insulin receptor and you're looking at 100 publications that discuss the insulin receptor. If each paper only discusses the insulin receptor, then uh, the PubMed score for that particular subset is of course 100 because it's 100 out of 100. But let's say each of the 100 papers talks about the insulin receptor in the context of 20,000 other proteins. In that case, the total score becomes 100 divided by 20,000. So it's a much smaller score. So the fractional count uh, becomes relevant. Lars has also come up with a co-occurrence score where he looks at the disease and uh, a protein and how they are mentioned in proximity inside the paper. So all that is adjusted into the diseases database and uh, it allows uh, for the automated uh, uh, evaluation of knowledge. This database is uh, updated weekly. It goes across all of the PubMed abstracts and uh, all the full text of PubMed Central. And uh, so when it does the full text of PubMed Central, it uses uh, BioBert. So uh, it uses uh, a transformer. Uh, Lars has played with multiple transformers. He has found BioBert to work the best. And uh, that's also described in a recent paper that we co-authored in, in database. And uh, one thing that uh, is new in diseases 2.0 is a tool called Taiga, which was developed by Jeremy Yang uh, uh, in my group at University of New Mexico, uh, where we look at the co-ranked co evidence of GWAS scores as an experimental channel. So we not only look at uh, the GWAS catalog, but we look at what's called the relative citation ratio. So that allows us to highlight uh, associations that are more likely to be true as opposed to other associations. Why is it important to uh, observe conventions in diseases? Because diseases are a mess. Uh, until recently, uh, it was believed that there are 7,000 rare diseases. It turns out that nobody had counted them. So when we sat down and counted them, and this is a uh, subject of a paper that we co-authored uh, two years ago, uh, and we pulled the information from multiple sources and they're listed here. And uh, I could probably talk uh, for an hour just about this subject. It turns out there may be at least 10,000 uh, rare diseases and we're considering uh, leaf nodes in the ontology. So uh, diseases that cannot be subcategorized in further uh, diseases. And uh, when we look at that, uh, of course, it, it puts things in a different perspective because if you cannot count rare diseases, you uh, the rare disease patients do not count. We wanted this to be the title, title of the paper, but uh, the editor of Nature Drug Discovery thought it was too confrontational. So uh, the title is just a bland, how many rare diseases are out there. The other thing that we noticed while we were uh, running this analysis, so uh, I had been approached by uh, Marco Prunotto, who is now at Galapagos, uh, to try to help him look at uh, uh, rare diseases and uh, therapeutic uh, opportunities in rare diseases. And uh, when we examine this, we try to address the question of what's called the translational gap. And the translational gap is best observed here. So this is the number of uh, genes uh, associated with other diseases uh, over a 30 year period. It goes back from 1987 to 2000, 2018. And uh, you can see that every year there's more and more and more and more papers. And this is on a log scale. And then on the other, at the bottom, you see the FDA approvals for rare diseases and the Europe approvals for rare diseases. And you can see there's like a three order of magnitude difference. And uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm to work in rare diseases, but uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to, to therapies. And uh, clearly something has to be done. So we, we argue about this and the opportunities in, in that paper. 
Sometimes it takes a lot of work to do this uh, type of uh, evaluation. And uh, this is a story that was uh, more than uh, eight years in the making. So the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium, IMPC, uh, they have systematically gone through a lot of uh, single gene null mouse lines, almost 4,000 of them. It, it takes a village, like 15 different centers, they have to set the same set of experiments. They have to run the same experiments. Uh, compatibility issues, a lot of things had to be ironed out. This was a uh, multi-million, multi-year uh, initiative on four continents. Uh, it's probably one of the single most uh, complex uh, biological projects uh, ever carried to date and the project still continues. And uh, what they did after, after doing this 4,000 experiments then uh, the question was uh, just looking at the cardiac angle with uh, electrocardiogram and with echocardiography. So there are two ways to look at cardiac phenotypes. Of course, one is to investigate the electric activity of the heart. As you all know, ECGs is basically they put electrodes and then they measure uh, the second derivative of the action potential. And that's what is the PQRST uh, wave. And then uh, that's the ECG. And then, of course, the other one is sound. So they look at the contraction and the, the sound the heart makes. This goes back to the stethoscope of the uh, physicians of the old days. And uh, once you do this type of experiments uh, systematically, then you can ask the question, how many of these are actually different compared to everything else, uh, compared to baseline? And then the short of it is, uh, and I helped uh, analyze this data set, it's a very complex data set, uh, almost 500 genes that uh, are relevant uh, in, in these models, uh, their perturbation leads to, to cardiac phenotypes. Uh, they had not pre previously been associated with uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, the most uh, significant one that uh, they found the uh, uh, human data from the UK bail bank. So the data was sitting there, just no one was looking for this particular gene. Uh, it's still considered too dark. Uh, it actually leads to uh, uh, heart uh, malfunctions in, in humans and, uh, and in mice as well. So uh, a lot of uh, mouse biology is, is informing uh, human biology as well. Uh, the title of my talk, when I talked to, when I sent uh, a, a title to, to Jose uh, a long time ago, uh, promised to talk about uh, Alzheimer's. So uh, I felt obligated to add the slides uh, uh, about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this uh, paper was four years in the making. Uh, it illustrates the perils of machine learning uh, and uh, the papers, of course, started with uh, the first observations from uh, Alois Alzheimer, who did uh, an autopsy of the brain of uh, a patient August D and uh, found uh, differences in the uh, neocortex in particular. So he described uh, these changes for the first time and said maybe these changes are associated with the fact that this patient had dementia. And uh, of course, it's an important uh, cause of death uh, Alzheimer's is uh, still ranked number seven uh, or, uh, as a cause of death. Uh, my own father had Alzheimer's and uh, he probably died because of it. So I was entirely motivated to, to work on this. And uh, I was just curious as to how to build a machine learning model that could inform us about uh, Alzheimer's. And this is sort of a uh, 2021 version of what we tried to do in uh, February 2018. So uh, uh, this was uh, the data sets that we used to build the uh, XGBoost model. So we used four sources for disease associations, uh, four sources for expression data, uh, pathways, interactions, of course, identifiers and, and functional information. And then this all uh, got into a database that was then converted into this uh, protein knowledge graph. And for the protein knowledge graph, the way we mined it is to look at the degrees of weighted path connectivity. This had been introduced by Daniel Himmelstein in his uh, PhD thesis uh, 
uh, I think about uh, the same time, so 2018, 2019, and this was, uh, so we did not invent this. What we did was to systematize it uh, in a much better way. Uh, Daniel had combined everything into a single channel. We kept the origin of the channel, so we were able to uh, bin expression data with expression data and pathways with pathways, not uh, uh, bundle everything together. And then, of course, we were careful to separate the gene lists into a test set and training set. And uh, out of that, we looked at the feature importance and we uh, deployed the machine learning. So these are the top 20 genes that uh, back uh, with the data set from uh, 2018 were predicted to be relevant uh, to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, of course, I probably should mention that one of the biggest weaknesses in uh, this type of endeavor is the lack of true negative data. So when you try to build a machine learning model for Alzheimer's, you find yourself, and not just Alzheimer's, any disease, you find yourself with the question, give me a set of genes that we know for sure are negative. And uh, the answer is far from trivial. Uh, there isn't a list of genes that anybody can say with absolute certainty these genes will never be discovered to be associated with Alzheimer's. Uh, so we started with uh, the list from OMIM, and uh, the list from OMIM was uh, considered to be associated with any other pathology except Alzheimer's, then we consider them that potentially they don't play a role in Alzheimer's. But of course, if you think about it, uh, if you take a gene that maybe is not associated with Alzheimer's, but maybe it expresses a gene that is associated with Alzheimer's, is it associated? Is it a true negative? Uh, it's it's uh, you know difficult to say. So these are the top uh, plus twenty, uh, the top positive labels that we uh, focused on. We then submitted a paper to communications biology and then the reviewers came back and said, well, uh, that's all fine and dandy, but we want you also to, to look at the bottom genes and tell us that they're not important in Alzheimer's. So these are the three sets of experiments that uh, Jessica Binder in the group of Kiran Baskar at UNM uh, set up to, to do. So that's why the paper took so long. Uh, it took a long time to do these sets of experiments. One set is to look at uh, human patient-derived stem cells and look at the gene of interest uh, RNA expression. The other set is to look at uh, RNA and Western blood expression for uh, post-mortem uh, autopsy brains uh, expression. And then the other set of experiments this took the longest to do is uh, sRNA dark down for the, for the top 20 genes that, that we, we used. So, a lot of experimental validation, and it's just summarized here uh, in multiple lanes. So this is the pluripotent stem cells. This is the autopsy, uh, Western blot, and gene expression with RNA. And this is the siRNAs. So it turns out that each of these that has a different color, like with the pluripotent cells uh, out of the top 20, maybe four genes uh, play a role. If you look at the other one here with the uh, uh, RNA data from, from post-mortem, there's about five genes. And if you look at the Western blot, there's a lot more. So according to at least the uh, experimental data, we weren't so terribly uh, with, with, with the scoring. Uh, and then of course, uh, additional evidence uh, is provided by, via uh, uh, sRNA. And then uh, to our chagrin, we found that there are some of the negatives that are also might be uh, important. And uh, it, this is really uh, at length discussed in the paper. First, we were unable to reproduce the algorithm because uh, Oleg Ursu, who wrote uh, the model, uh, left uh, UNM and started a job at Merck Research Labs in uh, October, 2018. And uh, we erased his computer, we lost the model, we tried to reproduce the model multiple times, we were unable to reproduce the model. And uh, that's why we didn't publish in Nature Machine Intelligence. Uh, but uh, communications biology at least had the common sense to say, okay, let's focus on the biology here and what you learn from machine learning. So what we learned from machine learning is that if you have a model, uh, keep it in place, freeze it, store it somewhere, don't store just the output, store everything make an image of it, look at the data, 
turns out that when we when we started uh, the model training, we used uh, a list of positive genes that came from the rat genome database. Uh, that list is no longer uh, present. We uh, via the way back uh, archive, way back machine, we we were able to find a file from somewhere in in 2018. But that list has been completely revised. It turns out it was the wrong list. So we were really lucky to to find uh, what we found eventually. But at least experimentally, we are quite sure that these are novel associations with Alzheimer's. Uh, some of them are dark proteins, which is really cool. That's what I was focused on. I was hoping to find something completely novel. What's equally important is that uh, what it paints out as a picture is that inflammation seems to be involved as a critical component, but not just inflammation, but also uh, infection. And that's also discussed in the model. So I know uh, some of you who follow Alzheimer's literature know there's controversy on whether uh, infection causes Alzheimer's or not. Uh, this machine learning model suggests it does. So a little bit uh, different, uh, three, three slides on a, on a very different data set. Uh, uh, Himonk, uh, I was part of a UNM Cancer Center. And so uh, we were curious uh, to try to, to help, uh, uh, try to build predictive machine learning models. Uh, can we look at, uh, at things? So we, we started with uh, Cosmic, uh, which is a, a uh, very important resource in, in uh, the oncology community, uh, more than 1 million mutation experiments. And uh, if you filter them, so of course we filter for primary site and we were primarily focused for Hemonc. We, we kept uh, biliary tract more or less as a control group, uh, histology subtype, tumor origin. So all these filters were, were included. And then we, we had a, a set of genes that was specific for each set. The advantage with these is that uh, each of the positive gene sets, and they're sort of listed here and they vary in number, but for each of these, we maintain the same set of genes as negative. And the negative genes were selected from a list. Uh, we, we applied uh, Lars Jensen's uh, list uh, uh, of diseases. And when you look at Lars Jensen's list of diseases, if you ask the question, how many of these proteins are associated with cancer? The answer is one in uh, two out of three human proteins are associated with cancer, according to literature. What that also means is that at least uh, one in three is not associated with cancer. So about 5,000 proteins, and uh, we eliminated those that were uh, T dark, T bio. So we focused on those well described, uh, T clean and T chem, because I assumed that, uh, for instance, the alpha adrenergic receptor, if it's on this list, uh, it's very likely that it doesn't play a major role in cancer. So, so that's how they ended up on that list. So we tried to be as careful as possible with the choice of negatives. This is, of course, uh, learning from the Alzheimer's lesson, right? So we wanted to have as good a set of true negatives as possible. So what you have here is 12 parallel machine learnings. And I think this sort of illustrates, uh, points to the future. Uh, you are really now moving into the ability to build multiple, many disease models that are comparable against each other. And if you're interested to understand, for instance, the acute myeloid leukemia, uh, there's three types that can be discriminated according to uh, cosmic, primary, recurring metastatic, and therapy-induced. So these are the unfortunate patients that had been treated for one cancer, and a few years later, they get full-fledged AML. And it turns out that AML is very different from the primary AML. And uh, so... What that also taught us is that some of these are actually quite similar. So uh, when, when I was talking to oncologists and I said, look, it looks like uh, mantle cell lymphoma and, and uh, Burkitt, you know, they, they might uh, uh, have uh, some similarities. And so all of these that are common to, to do the different cancers on the gene list, that sort of indicates that you could potentially find therapeutic approaches if there's a therapeutic approach that's approved for, say, uh, therapy-induced AML, you can deploy it against Burkitt because they have 
uh, this common set of genes. So uh, this is where I'm heading with this. So it gives you different therapeutic approaches that might have practical applications and not just in oncology, just that it turns out that these are unique. Uh, one thing of course to learn is that polycythemia vera, which is a cancer of the red blood cells, is very, very different from any of the other cancers. So none of the drugs that work in this would be applicable to this. And this, of course, to the practicing oncologist is well known, but uh, to come out from the machine learning angle and say, this is our conclusion as well, is sort of reassuring and uh, gives us uh, impetus to, to move in, in, into the right direction. So I'll switch to drugs. And uh, just briefly mention drugcentral.org. Uh, this is a resource that we've been publishing. Uh, there's three drug central papers in nucleic acids research. Uh, we're working on number four. Uh, and what we added in the last one is a machine learning model called Redial. And I'll touch upon that in a second. And uh, we also added uh, and I know Jordi Mestres talked about this yesterday where uh, he looked at FIRES data, so Federal Adverse Reports System uh, and MEDRA. Uh, unlike Jordi's system that covers everything, we only select uh, adverse events reported by uh, practicing uh, uh, medical practitioners. So we do not include uh, uh, adverse events reported by lawyers or uh, patients. And uh, this is just a difference of approach. Uh, take it or leave it. If you want to use Jordi's approach, of course, uh, you have to subscribe to his system. Uh, otherwise, this is completely downloadable. And uh, it allows you to separate uh, side effects by sex. And uh, so we're, we're doing a separation men versus women. And uh, we recently also cleaned up. So for the next version, we have cleaned up and eliminated the medical terms that match indications. So for example, one of the top side effects for uh, hepatitis C drugs is hepatitis C. And it doesn't make sense because unless you put a live virus in the hepatitis C pill, you cannot give someone hepatitis C. So uh, it, this is where uh, data cleanliness becomes important. Uh, one of the things that really bothered me in the beginning of the pandemic is publication by Twitter and uh, publication by TV and radio show. And uh, you all know the stupid stories about chloroquine and ivermectin which are not cures uh, and uh, all the stupidity that followed and it just illustrated how much anti-science uh, exists in the world today. And uh, so I teamed up with uh, Jeremy Levin and Alex Javronkov uh, and a bunch of other smart people. And we, we wrote this commentary uh, and it took Nature Biotechnology four months they were sitting on the paper for four months, not knowing whether to approve it or not. And eventually they, they decided to approve it. Uh, we were arguing that there must be better ways to uh, stop the deluge of uh, preprints that were all computational uh, uh, without any scientific evidence, without any backup, uh, no common sense, et cetera, et cetera. So we were trying to, to say, hey, uh, hold your horses, publish real science, don't rush to publication because you're just adding to the noise. Uh, so one of the papers that came out of this was uh, Redial. Uh, of course, this is a joke. We wished like everybody else to redo 2020. So that's why we called it Redial. Uh, we started with uh, a lot of data from the NCATS uh, portal. They had uh, systematically tested uh, a set of about 8,000 molecules uh, in multiple COVID assays uh, related to live virus infectivity, viral entry, and viral replication. And uh, essentially, this is a simplified view. If you go to Redial, it gives you 11 different assays plus the sigma receptor, so 12 different predictions at the moment. And uh, uh, we try to make it as clear as possible how to use the website, how to interpret the results. And of course, the paper uh, describes everything in NMI. Uh, one of the molecules that we identified during the 
May through September period of 2020 was Amodiaquine. Uh, we teamed up with uh, Colleen Johnson at the UT Memphis Health Sciences Center. Uh, this was the key assay that we thought was the most telling. Uh, and it took about a year to get to this assay with uh, Colleen because we weren't paying for it and she was running a contract research lab. Uh, so if you look here, uh, you see remdesivir in this viral titration assay. What viral titration means is that you add the compound to a small amount of virus, and then you keep the compound constant, but you increase the dose of virus and you look at viral growth. And you see here that chloroquine has no effect. Uh, Ambroxol, which had been talked early on, has no effect. This was pushed by Beringer Ingelheim into the clinic. I don't think they progressed anywhere. Uh, some of the computational hits that we identified based on similarity with chloroquine, I admit, uh, were uh, desetyl amodiaquine, which is, uh, this is amodiaquine, but basically you take one of these off, that's DAQ. Uh, so DAQ is uh, a metabolite. It stays in the blood for about three weeks. So uh, has a half-life of three weeks. It's a very interesting drug. And you can see that in the viral titration assay, it shows it has very clear antiviral properties. Remdesivir works. Uh, we also had nebivalol and zuclopentixol as potential backup candidates, but we uh, clearly were focused on uh, DAQ. Uh, this is not our work. This is experimental uh, confirmation of amodiaquine uh, from uh, Harvard and Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And the key experiments, uh, this is a much longer paper, but I chose to highlight three key experiments here. Uh, and this paper came about uh, eight months after our paper. Uh, and uh, they know of our work. Basically, uh, you give amotiaquine and it protects uh, so the virus doesn't grow when you, when you give it to, to human cells. Then you give it to, to hamsters and uh, there's a clear viral load reduction when you give the drug. And then you can also give the drug to animals that are not directly infected, but they are in a cage with uh, infected animals. So this is called viral transmission. So it blocks viral infection and it blocks viral transmission. And uh, the short of it is, uh, 10 pills of amodiaquine, it's on the list of WHO essential medicines. 10 pills cost uh, like 100 rupees. Uh, one set of remdesivir cost $2,000. Uh, simply put, the world had no appetite for amodiaquine. It works. And we tried, I tried to talk to the government of India multiple times. I tried to approach the FDA to approach the government of India as well. Uh, the evidence is very clear no one was interested. Uh, I think I'm way past the time. So I don't know, uh, Jose, do you want me to keep going or should I stop here? Because I, I don't know. It's up to you. You're the organizer. So Tudor, feel free to, I mean, it's, it's past time, but I think this is a unique opportunity. So feel free to, uh, as okay. you wish. Okay. All right, so those of you who have other things to do, uh, I, I don't mind, I'll just keep going. But uh, just to, to give you a very brief glimpse of my uh, most recent career. So uh, the next set of slides uh, show some of my experience within Royvant. Uh, we are building something called the Quasar platform, which integrates uh, QM and high level molecular simulations uh, and uh, quantum chemistry with a lot of uh, machine learning. And uh, uh, we're basically building everything from the ground up. Uh, we have tons of, tons of uh, CPU power. Uh, we're even doing uh, our own chip research to try to optimize uh, specific chips. We have about uh, half experimentalists and half computational people div divided between Boston and New York. And we are basically a fully integrated uh, pharma discovery company. We are part of Royvan Sciences. Uh, Royvan Sciences started about eight years ago. It already has five FDA approved drugs. The most recent one, uh, Tapiranov, uh, Tapinarov uh, comes from Dermavant and uh, 
uh, it's now commercialized under the trade name Vitama. And uh, this was approved just two weeks ago. In fact, uh, we're having a party in New York on June 29 to celebrate uh, our fifth drug. So either way you look at it, uh, five approved drugs in eight years, it's pretty good for a new pharma company. So I was proud to join them in, in February. And uh, one of my tasks, uh, I, I have several hats, but one of my tasks was to help uh, build machine learning models. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the aqueous solubility and the uh, herd models, but specifically uh, our one of our tasks uh, and all the medicinal chemistry teams were saying, we need models for solubility, we need models for permeability. So. Uh, some lessons learned because even though I had been practicing QSAR since 1989, uh, there were things I had forgotten. I had to relearn. So, of course, uh, one of the things that was quite useful is uh, uh, thanks to NCATS and their uh, benevolence, uh, you can download this particular set and you can build uh, this is straight RD kit uh, using the R package. Uh, you can build a pretty decent model on rat uh, liver microsomal stability. Once you start to add uh, internal compounds, uh, the predictivity improves. Uh, then I spent hours cleaning this solubility data set from the uh, Burnham Institute. Uh, the uh, assay ID is here. So this is water solubility. Uh, it's almost uh, 60,000 compounds. Uh, I, I try to prep them as well as possible. Uh, the model is worthless. I, I used uh, Igor Tetko's OCHEM tool uh, online to try to build models. This is basically cannot do anything. This is a completely dud data set. So the model is worthless because the data set is worthless. So one thing I learned with this particular uh, angle is you think you have 60,000 compounds worth of data, you have 60,000 uh, worth of garbage. And uh, there's no other words I can say about this particular assay. Uh, so I had to reshuffle and ask, okay, what's wrong with this picture? Clearly getting 60,000 compounds for water solubility is not the way forward. Uh, thermodynamic solubility is not what they were using. They are using uh, kinetic solubility. So uh, luckily, NCATS also has a kinetic solubility model. Uh, what I ended up doing is taking their public set for kinetic solubility and then added the 2021 measured compounds and then predicting all of 2022. And uh, it's pretty good. It nails uh, 84 out of 87 uh, internal compounds. Uh, I would have put a shout out to Data Warrior. Data Warrior is a really great tool, but don't trust their solubility model. Uh, this is the R square on solubility predicted with Data Warrior uh, for the uh, 2000 compounds. Uh, it's just doesn't work. The other set that uh, chemists were screaming about is uh, avoiding herd liability. And of course, when you look at it from the outside, you say, oh, wait a minute, uh, Campbell is rich in data, so let's just go to Campbell. And uh, yes, there is uh, like uh, 28,000 data points that we could get. And uh, those of you who might remember a long time ago, I had a company called Sunset Molecular and uh, that was the Wombat database. So I took uh, data that were in Wombat, but not Campbell. So I try to use every single uh, angle as possible. Uh, once you end up sorting them by unique compounds and normalizing, there's three types of uh, assays, radio ligand binding. And these are the three major radio ligands, dofetilid, MAK499, and astemizole. There's patch clamp. It turns out patch clamp is what Roy Vant is very interested in and other. And by the way, uh, and I forgot to add the data set here, there's about 300,000 compounds on a patch clamp. Uh, that would have been uh, this slide, but with a uh, herd patch clamp on that uh, 300,000 data set, it's worthless. Uh, so these are the three data sets. Uh, straight RD kit doesn't work. So had to rely on uh, Igor Tetko's OCHEM and uh, tried multiple types of models and uh, some models are better than others. And of course there's uh, 
uh, deep neural networks seem to be uh, the ones that are most predictive on a, a external set and uh, this is just a sample of of how it looks like on the on the normalized patch clamp including uh, data that were internal so we're deploying the OCAM platform internally. Uh, it, it's a really great uh, resource. I, I highly recommend uh, uh, as academics, you all can set an account and start playing with OCAM today. Uh, so here is where it got really interesting. About uh, a month and a half ago, uh, after building a model for MDCK permeability, I got this particular uh, plot. And I was like, okay, should I celebrate? Is there something? wrong here. So I completely changed the prediction. This was a prediction set. I completely changed the smiles for the prediction set to a different set. This was Royvant internal. It looked just as good. So my colleague Christian Vologa and I, we went for ice cream. We celebrated. We were like, we're going to replace uh, experiments in Royvant for MDCK permeability. This was not the story that was behind the story. The story behind the story was that we were inadvertently using uh, the experimental value as a descriptor. And of course, when you do that, you get these tight lines. So uh, of course, uh, when something looks too good to be true, uh, you don't trust it. So even though we just initially changed the data set and we got uh, very similar results, we were happy, but then we looked uh, additionally into the code and we found that's not the case. So uh, we were still happy to eat ice cream, but we did not have a model. Here's why we didn't have a model. So if you look at uh, all the Campbell compounds for MDCK permeability, uh, those are the Royvan compounds. They're basically exploring a chemical space of their own that has nothing to do with Campbell. So uh, the best way forward is to combine uh, again, we used 2021 data from Royvant uh, and predicted 2022. So, uh, of course, this prediction looks much better. I don't want to give specific numbers, but here's sort of a uh, summary of the data attrition. Uh, when you really look at Campbell, you think there's like 24,000 uh, entries. So it looks like a lot of data is out there, but if you clean it up, uh, from 24,000, you maybe end up with uh, 1,700 and maybe uh, 600 the other way. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, B2A is basal to apical. So it's like uh, looking from the blood towards the gut. And you have to measure that as well because you don't want your compound to efflux back into the intestine. So you look at permeability that goes from the intestine to the blood and then blood to intestine and you sort of have to run models for both. So of course we, we have models for both. This is just the A to B uh, permeability. So what we learned from this particular set, and again, these were lessons that I sort of knew from AstraZeneca, but I discovered that uh, when I left AstraZeneca in 2002, there was no Campbell, now there is. But if you look, Purely at Campbell, uh, you cannot predict internal company data. Uh, this ground truth is known to all pharma companies. And so the problem is nobody is really impressed when you write yet another QSAR on public data. Uh, it's really cool, but the algorithm is not really the issue. In fact, the algorithm is rarely the issue. The issue is quality of the data. So garbage in, garbage out. You really need your ground truth. You need to anchor your model as much as possible. So the best path forward, if you have a data set that's internal that you cannot really talk about, what you have to spend a lot of time is find that literature that is compatible with your model. So in other words, you can download all of HERG out of uh, Campbell, but it turns out you really want the patch uh, clamp technique. So you don't want all of Campbell on HERG, you want uh, that which is uh, related. So assay compatibility and chemical space complementarity, they're key towards good practice model building. So hopefully you, you'll take these lessons to heart. I wish I could tell you more about the tricks we're using, uh, but uh, of course I, I, I cannot uh, for obvious reasons. So 
again, in the spirit of talking to a younger generation, I thought I would uh, end up with uh, some advice for future scientists. So hopefully those of you who are still around and are young and enthusiastic, uh, uh, try to think about what I'm about to say because I learned lots of these things the hard way. First of it is, ask yourselves, what are you doing? Is it relevant to the problem you're trying to solve? If you're looking at electrostatic charges just for the sake of a QSAR model, maybe using the Gastiger Marsili charges will give you just as good results as a 61G double star or you know DFT, the latest uh, generation, because uh, they may not be necessary if you're looking at trends. Of course, if you're looking at the specific atom and inside a protein, and it's really important because you have a zinc nearby and that perturbation will cause multiple electronic interactions, then uh, it might be warranted to go uh, deep quantum chemistry. So try to avoid overkill uh, when it comes to, to current standards. Uh, one of my favorite examples is, is uh, a, a CONFA paper on oral bioavailability. It's, it's completely idiotic. Uh, I don't want to point out who wrote it because that's not the point, but uh, you just don't want to do that. The other thing that's bothering me over and over and over again is I do not trust biology. Uh, I'm not the first to say this, but if you actually look, there's, uh, and I will share the slides, uh, uh, Jose already has a copy. Uh, eLife uh, has published a series of papers on, on uh, biological uh, reproducibility. And these are quotes from these papers. No single effect experiment or paper provides definitive evidence about its claim. Innovation identifies possibility, but verification interrogates credibility. So you need to verify. It's uh, to quote uh, Alex Tropsha, who quotes the uh, first head of the KGB, trust but verify. The other thing, of course, is innovation without verification will lead to incredible results, meaning they cannot be reproduced. And that is just going to create friction. And uh, you know that's, that's not a good situation to be in. It's not just the biology you should question. You need to look at uh, even X-ray crystallography. There's a paper in uh, Angevante Chemie by Andy Davis and Gerard Clivate. Uh, X-ray crystallography models were not always correct. Uh, 20,000 retracted papers in PubMed, including about a thousand that are what's called a paper mill. So there are organizations out there that help you write papers that are completely false, but look completely legit. Try to think what that means. So the other thing is, it's something it's too good to be true. It probably is too good to be true. So Theranos, for example, uh, try to find the simplest model to test your hypothesis, but always test it in multiple ways. Uh, run your own benchmarks, build your own models. Don't trust other people's models without simple verification, right? There's lots of hypes. Some of them get the Nobel Prize, but unless you're really lucky and you follow that path, uh, you're just going to follow hype every year. And uh, I try to not encourage people to do that. Uh, metrics in QSAR at least are irrelevant. To me, the only proof is external unbiased predictivity. I don't care about the F1 scores. I don't care about uh, uh, sensitivity, you know, confusion matrix, all those are words. What really matters is build a model that works on temporally validated data. And by temporally validated, start with data, say from 2018 and before, and then predict the model uh, with data from 2019 and later. That's uh, temporal validation. Science is not a democracy. Uh, just because we all believed that the earth was flat in 1500 didn't make the earth flat. It just was a belief that was widely shared, not necessarily true. Uh, so facts change over time. I would encourage people to choose topics that open people to new possibilities. Uh, don't get stuck with a single technology. Try to evolve and, and, and look at uh, ways to apply new ideas, new techniques. Always go to the source. Make sure you understand the basics. My challenge is uh, try to explain to a five-year-old what you do. If you manage, then you understand the concepts. Uh, 
uh, when my son Alex, he was my firstborn, he asked me, Dad, what do you do? And uh, of course, I was like, oh, I do virtual screening. How do you explain virtual screening to a five-year-old? So I had to explain. I was like, look, uh, the garage is like the receptor and the car is like the drug and you might try to fit the car in the garage. And so when I explained it that way, then he understood and he sort of had an idea what I'm doing. So nothing is what it seems. Verify, doubt, and always get independent confirmation. And that is how you, over the test of time, you will be able to stand by your work. You put your name on it, right? The other thing, and I know this may sound out there, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. When somebody asks you a question at a conference and uh, you never thought about it before, just say, gee, I didn't think about it. Uh, don't try to come up with an explanation that's completely false. Uh, probably Jordi, if he's still around, remembers. Uh, at one point when I interviewed with Organon, I was asked a trick question. I was the first candidate to give a truthful answer, which was, I don't know. I don't think I can answer that question. Everybody else tried to fudge it before me. And uh, they were using it as a test to select people who would actually tell them the truth. Uh, even if you don't know, you should be ready to learn. Focus on problem solving skills. And if you have coworkers that think out of the box, try to reward creativity and out of the box thinking. Also, it's a lot more important to work with high quality people than to have the fanciest equipment. Uh, it happened to me that people steal ideas. Uh, it just happens, you can't get bogged into that, you just have to move on. Uh, and uh, this is personal advice, figure out what you're afraid of. If you learn to deal from it from the inside, uh, it's the better course of action. Uh, this is sort of uh, almost like Yoda. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to violence, etc. Yeah. Violence leads to suffering. And uh, other than that, uh, I'd say, where do we, where do I think five years from now we will end up? I think uh, the golden age of uh, machine learning slash QSAR in chemical informatics is upon us. Uh, there's a lot more tools than ever before. There's a lot of enthusiastic practitioners. Nobody thinks, like Johnny Gasteiger said yesterday, nobody thinks chemistry can be done without computers. Uh, drug discovery the same way. I don't think anybody can imagine drug discovery without uh, computers. So best way forward is to create partnerships. And we should probably try to focus on significant machine learning model generation. Why do I say that? Because a lot of models, we can build a lot of models very quickly, but validating them takes a lot of effort and time. But it's probably the only way to eliminate bias because when you build models, you don't have an ax to grind. You just come up with models and maybe it's time to rethink uh, computational medicine in, in that uh, light. Uh, last slide before last. Uh, this is sort of the evolution of the human brain uh, over time. Uh, there's a focus that goes from, you know, counting toes, fact and fantasy. This is like the adolescence trying to learn fact from fiction. Once you reach adulthood, you sort of figure out your goals, your motivation, your opportunities. So your horizon expands a lot. You're still on the path for uh, knowledge, but then the more you focus, the more your uh, kernel of understanding is, is out there. So you're, it focuses the mind a lot better. Deliberation, awareness, understanding, and you're sort of thinking, okay, now that I figured out a lot of the things that I didn't know when I was just counting my toes, how do I want to move forward? What's my next step? And then towards the end, uh, you're ready to share your wisdom and uh, compensate. So, Last slide, what we know is a drop, what we don't know is an ocean. So try to do your best to add a drop of science to the ocean of knowledge. So uh, that was my last slide. That's impressive, Dudar. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, insightful talks. All the, the research has been fantastic. I don't know if anybody in the audience here in the chat uh, wants to post a, a question or open your your mix so you're getting a lot of nice comments in the chat 
I do not make an apology for being late. Uh, I gave a fair, fair warning to everyone in advance. No, that's perfectly fine. Sir. Really appreciate taking all the time. And as you mentioned, you are not feeling that 100% uh, in good health. So many thanks for that, for yeah, yeah, for taking the extra time and extra effort. And I know, as everybody else, all the speakers are quite busy. So quite, quite grateful. So I, I probably it's a little bit uh, late, especially now that, that, that in Europe. Um, but personally, Tudor and all the speakers, I really want to thank you. And in behalf of all the organizers for, for sharing these fantastic talks, all the conferences uh, will be are uh, permanently recorded in, in YouTube. So maybe someone else that cannot catch up uh, can watch the, the video later. Uh, Johnny, I see you turned on your video. Did you want to comment something? You're on mute. Ludo, a fantastic talk. And uh, thank you. I think what you said at the end, the recommendations are, are really, really important, you know. And we can only trust on the new generation of researchers that they follow your advices. Okay. Thank you. Jordi, also you have your, your microphone open. You want to comment on something? Uh, first of all, I think it was a very good selection of speakers and it was a broad, uh, broad perspectives of uh, the present stage of, of research. And uh, I think you did a good job of it. Uh, assembling these speakers and uh, uh, something like that should be done more often. I think uh, such symposia are more important than the symposia that uh, always say I'm the greatest and uh, I've done the best. I think we, we should be more humble yeah, what we have done and uh, should yeah. point more out what still has to be done and, and where to go. Uh, and where are problems? I think the, uh, the young people need to get the feeling that there's still a lot to be done. And some of the tools are there, but they all can be improved. Yeah. Okay, good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Johnny. So yeah, definitely uh, we are very happy. I mean, all the organizers very happy that uh, all of you agree to, to to speak at this. I would say first chemioinformatics conference in in in, in UNAM in, in Mexico. So everybody here in I would say at least myself, the, the students are following your your work, your your publications. We are continuously learning and getting inspired by your work. So it's also always nice to have uh, to be in touch with the people that we are continuously learning. So really, really honored for your you. yeah. for your time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, there you also and all speakers having more uh, comments on the on, on, on the chat. So I'm just gonna give a few closing remarks of this uh, colloquium. And on behalf of all the organizers, we wanna thank all the speakers and all the 15 uh, speakers of the sessions of uh, these past three days. So we're also very grateful to the audience in Zoom and social media and YouTube and Facebook that have been following the session, sessions live. As I just mentioned, everything is, uh, is recorded on YouTube. So Everybody feel free to watch again or watch later these uh, conferences. And now I'd like to share a couple of slides with a very important thing that I'd like to, to, to say. It's a big thank you to all of the, the people that has been 
uh, behind and around this colloquium. Of course, many thanks to uh, Dr. Carlos Amador, Miguel Costa, San Francisco Hernandez, authorities of the School of Chemistry, Facultad de Química, for their support. Many thanks to all the people, uh, members of the informatics, outreach, and communication team here at the School of Chemistry, uh, especially to Dr. Uh, excuse me, Engineering Aida Hernandez, Edgar Lopez, Cedric, Margarita, Veronica Benet, Jose Adelfo, and, and so many others that uh, has been making this colloquium possible. Thank you so much. Also, I wanna thank um, members of the DIFACIM Research Group, Master in Science, Ana Luisa Chavez, uh, Fernanda Saldívar, Edgar Lopez, uh, for co-chairing and be part of the organization. Also the students, Alejandro Ochoa, Hassan Villegas, and all members of the, the research group that in the past few months have been doing a, a fantastic job to make this colloquium happen. So uh, there are about 1,200 uh, registrations for this colloquium. Here in the slide are the 10 top countries that got registered. There are seven, uh, 77, uh, 67 different countries, and we will be sharing all the videos with all people that got uh, registered. Uh, roughly half of the audience are students, but as you can see from these slides, people from different uh, like occupations, like academics, uh, working in industry, uh, researchers are also joining the, the, the colloquium. We got registrations from uh, different institutions. Here are the top uh, most uh, registrations from Mexico, most of them from, from UNAM, from Instituto Politecnico Nacional, from Morelos, UAM, et cetera. Many thanks to all the people that registered and of course, from several other institutions that are not in this slide. And uh, muchas gracias por unirse. Many thanks to all of the speakers and the audience. Hope to see you soon next time. Thank you, Jose, for putting such a wonderful conference together and a really good list of speakers and topics. Really good. Gracias. Gracias, Tudor. Thank you.